this morning. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to the December 11th, 2017 meeting of the Shawnee County Board of Commissioners. My name is Bob Archer. I currently have the honor of serving as chairman of the commission and representing District 3 alongside Commissioner Shelley Bueller, who represents District 1, and Commissioner Kevin Cook, who represents District 2. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Good morning. morning. First item of business, please. Uh, first item is item two, unfinished business. Number one, consider approval of request to purchase 134 Hewlett-Packard personal computer workstations, including a three-year warranty for each, using the state of Kansas contract pricing from cdwg.com at a cost not to exceed, exceed $120,000 with funding from the 2017 IT budget. Good morning, Commissioners. <clears throat> Pat O'Blend with the Information Technology Department. Uh, last Thursday, I threw out the wrong numbers for the distributions on PCs that we're going to be putting into uh, various offices. Um, <clears throat> the correct numbers are the IT department will be uh, having 14 machines replaced, uh, health department will be 70, elections would be 13, and then parks and rec would be 37. Last week, I think I threw together parks and rec and elections and came up with 50, which was an incorrect <laughs> number. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. I think those numbers sound about right. Thank you. <laughs> they do. Thanks for the clarification. I'll move to approve. Second. Yeah, thank you for the information. Uh, motion made to approve by Commissioner Bueller, now seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries three to zero. Thank, thank you. Thank Pat. you, Commissioners. Next item, please. Out of three, consent agenda. There were six items on the consent agenda. Were there any questions or comments? I have none. I move approval. Second. Motion made to approve the consent agenda by Commissioner Bueller, seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries three to zero. Next item, please. Item four, <coughs> new business, A County Clerk number one, consider all voucher payments. Commissioners, this morning we have vouchers that total $523,657.54. <coughs> The highlights out of that voucher report, health insurance premiums for employees of $108,848.20, the IT department of $170,888.06, uh, the motor vehicle department and treasurer's office $47,880.56, the majority of that is the lease at the annex for the motor vehicle uh, annex for the treasurer's office. The uh, holding accounts with the state of Kansas, $18,965.05, and the appraiser's office of $31,365.13, of which the majority was with Keller, Craig, and Associates. I do not have any questions with the vouchers and would move for the approval. Second. Motion made to approve the vouchers by <coughs> Commissioner Cook, and that was seconded by Commissioner Bueller. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries three to zero. Next item, please. Item A2, consider correction orders. Move for approval. Second. Motion made to approve the correction orders by Commissioner Bueller, seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries three to zero. Next item, please. Item A3, consider approval of resolution number 2017-83, authorizing a cereal malt beverage license, including Sunday sales for La Roca's Pizza Express, located at 5145 Southwest Topeka Boulevard. <coughs> And this is, we're getting down to the last of our CMBs for the year. Uh, everything has been reviewed by the counselor's office. The, uh, there are no delinquent taxes. KBI has been notified, as was the township, and, and it had the health inspection. So we're good to go. Very good. Thank you, Cindy. I'll move to adopt the resolution. Second. Motion made to approve by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Bueller. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries three to zero. Next item, please. Item B, Health Department number one, consider authorization and execution of contract C447-2017 with Dr. Gio, Dr. Gio Pizzino, MD, MPH, to uh, continue serving in the capacity of health officer for Shawnee County for the period of January 1, 2018 through December 31st, 2018. 
Good morning, Commissioners. Linda Oaks from the Health Department. This uh, agreement before you is to continue our relationship with Dr. Pizzino as our health officer. He um, helps respond to public health emergencies. He helps with the investigation of chemical disease outbreaks. Actually, he usually leads those. Um, he helps with control measures with those. He engages the medical community on public health issues. Uh, he signs off on our standing orders for our STI clinic, our sexual transmitted infection clinic, as well as our immunization clinic. Dr. Pizzino is truly an expert in this field. I feel very fortunate to be working with him. He's been recognized uh, statewide, nationally, internationally for his work in public health. And also a year ago, he received the Crumbine Medal with the Kansas Public Health Association, which is their highest honor. So. And I would be happy to answer any questions. <coughs> I think we're fortunate. Yeah. Any questions or comments? No. Uh, I make requests. questions. Just a comment. He's very involved in the community as well. I believe he will be serving on the Go Topeka board in, in the near future right. as well. So, thank you for that. Yes, yeah. he he is starting in January. So I'm Good. very excited to have public health involved yeah. with Go Topeka. Excellent. Mm -hmm. I'll move to approve the contract. Second. Motion made to approve the contract by Commissioner Bueller, seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor, say aye. Opposed, no. <coughs> Motion carries three to zero. Thank you. Linda. Thank you, Linda. Next item, please. Item C, Parks and Recreation. Number one, consider approval of request to pay uh, Napheed Truck Equipment Center for purchase and installation of three snow plow blades assemblies at a, a cost of $17,829 from the operating budget. Good morning, Commissioners. John Knight, Parks and Recreation. Uh, anticipating that we're going to need some snow blades, I had staff go out and uh, get, get snow blades for a couple of the new vehicles that uh, we started leasing. Uh, when they went and got the low bids, they uh, the three the three purchased together uh, would uh, uh, go over the ten thousand dollars. And after visiting with uh, uh, Betty Griner, she suggested that we repair that in this method. Be happy to answer any other questions you may have. Questions for Mr. Knight? On with approval. Second. Motion made to approve the request by Commissioner Cook, and that was seconded by Commissioner Bueller. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries three to zero. Next item, please. Item C2, consider approval of request to create a new position of professional development and services superintendent at an annual salary including benefits of $64,666.99 and approval to fill any positions that become vacant as a result of filling this one. Uh, commissioners, uh, I've worked uh, real close with uh, uh, Angela Lewis on this, which means basically my first three or four uh, ideas got shot down. The one we actually came up with is the one you've got here in front of you today, that that uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, professional development and services superintendent. Uh, they'll work with uh, our develop a customer service program for us and, and uh, set up a professional training thing for all of our employees in our office communication, all of those type of things. Be happy to answer any other questions you may have. So only your first three or four got shot down? Yes, sir. I'm getting... I'm You're getting, improving your, yeah, your you. percentage, John. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, can you, I know we've done a lot of reorganizing in Parks and Rec, and it's, it's all linked back to the master plan. How does this fit in with that? Oh, the, 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 uh, all of the things that this person, uh, what we had done before was several of those things were spread across our, our top tier of uh, administrators. This brings focus, and those are all, both all of those things that I just listed are all uh, initiatives of our master plan. Instead of spreading it out amongst the top tier people, it's going to be one person is going to be in charge of that department wide. Just a question. Yes. And John, you said for all employees, so seasonal employees too, as oh, far as helping with the, the hiring <coughs> transition, all of that. In, in, uh, everything with people, uh, the seasonal employees, uh, permanent employees, volunteer program, uh, part, uh, partnerships in which we have groups coming in to, to volunteer as a group, all of that this person will be involved with. Okay. Yes, Commissioner Cook. <clears throat> Well, tell me out here then, John. We have a person who's in charge of volunteer coordination. We're not replacing that person, though, right? No. So, but this is going to act more as an HR role with Parks and Recreation? It does have a lot of HR components with it. Yes, sir. Okay. And so, why would the Parks and Rec, what makes Parks and Rec need their own HR person as opposed to having it operated through our human resources department. But, uh, this per, uh, person would work real close with the HR department, but we have close to 800 seasonal employees that come on starting around the uh, 
uh, in the past it started around the end of March, but hopefully with a position like this we can begin to fill some of those ranks in the other months because uh, there's really no need to follow the calendar year. But that, that is one of the, the main reasons is uh, the 800 seasonal employees that come on. Okay. And then talk to me about this uh, professional development. What is it that we're going to be expecting for this employee to do? Uh, look at the job descriptions that, that we have, set up professional training for them, which board sh uh, should they be a part of, which committee should they be a part of, uh, community-wide. Uh, if they're going to go to a training that it's uh, focused to the master plan and to the, or excuse me, to their job description and the master plan. Uh, if you're a welder, uh, go to welder training, we're not sending you to tree, to, uh, tree maintenance uh, conferences, those type of things. So is Parks and Rec planning on being more strategic in their involvement with the community and making sure that we get the right people hooked up with the right organizations? Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. I'll move to approve the request. I'll second. Motion made to approve by Commissioner Archer, seconded by <laughs> Commissioner Bueller. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries three to zero. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner. Josh. Next item, please. Item D, Sheriff's Office number one, consider establishing a project fund and transfer $100,000 from the 2017 budgeted funds for the installation of a high-speed internet network and a storm shelter at the Bard Training Complex. Good morning, Commission. Herman Jones, Shawnee County Sheriff there. What you have before you is uh, basically just looking for uh, uh, a method of what we can do to better prepare ourselves for uh, inclement weather or uh, incidents that may they come uh, for a training facility out there. Right now, there's there's really no protection out there uh, when we talk about any type of a shelter for uh, tornadoes or those type of things right there. And at the same time, we're trying to improve the connectivity of, uh, of our uh, doing training and those type of things when we're on the web and whatever else. And we've worked with uh, Betty Griner on this right here as well as with uh, uh, IT and what we're trying to do is just take because of that project what we have we're just taking the monies that we have and put it into a special project so we can uh, push that out a little bit further it's good not knowing how long that will take but be able to have some type of funding we can do that and it is coming from the budget from our budget uh, I guess the question I have sheriff is is I was reading a, an article on CJ uh, that was dated September 20th 2010 it was by Tim Rencher actually and uh, it talked about the new range uh, being unveiled and it was a 1.4 million dollar facility but it was financed all with drug seized drug money mm -hmm. uh, and uh, <coughs> Sheriff Barter said there were no tax dollars used to pay the complex's 1.4 million price tag does it make sense to use drug money for this enhancement to the, the firing range? Well, I think what, what, what came from that right there was at that particular time, we didn't have the fundings for uh, building a facility such as that right there. So that was what we were used. And basically when we talk about forfeiture money, it's basically for those items that are not been budgeted uh, for that particular time. So uh, I, I get what you're saying, but right, right at this point, we, we do have the budget for that right there. So that's what we're looking at going there. Okay. So it's your preference that we yeah. use budget instead of going yes. to the, the forfeiture fund. Yeah. Okay. Additional, yes, Commissioner Cook. Well, there was an additional article here, uh, March the 22nd, 2014, from the Capital Journal, where you yourself is quoted as saying, it's bad guys paying to train good guys. Sheriff Barta did not want this to be a burden on the county. Mm -hmm. I just really I struggle with why we're shifting if we if we have the forfeiture funds available why we wouldn't use those funds as that's been the purpose of the training facility is to have it supported because the forfeiture funds as I read can only be used for certain things like training and, and, and training facility uh, whereas your budget could be used for other things and once your budget's set, you're able to do with it as you need. And I, I know that your undersheriff was extremely critical of the commission early in the year about not having enough money set aside to hire on additional officers. Um, and I just, I'm making sure that we are following the same creed. And if we're changing direction, 
why we're changing direction. No, what we have right there is just, it, yes, it does become a point of my discretion of how to use those funds and those type of things right there. But at the same time, when we're talking about a project such as this, it's not necessarily just for training. This is something for public safety. Individuals in that area could actually use that, that, that shelter right there. So this becomes that budget of uh, something that I wanted to use for public safety and those type of things. And yes, we can use it for training and those type of things right there. It becomes a discretionary uh, at that particular time or so. Uh, Sheriff Barta felt that need. I felt a need to go uh, a little bit different direction or so. But we do have money set aside for the training purposes of that right there. And this is a project fund, which means we're planning on doing the actions in 2018 as opposed to 2017? Yeah, we wouldn't be able to get this done in, in a bit close of this year right now. So we're just trying to push that over into it, taking the 2017 funds and pushing them in it so we can get the project done in a reasonable pound time. Additional questions? Yes, Commissioner Beal. Sheriff, um, is this the total cost of the project or are you going to be using other funds in addition to this, budgeted funds? This is approximately what we have. It's, we're probably just trying to uh, make sure we have enough for the whole project. It probably wouldn't be this much, but we want to make sure we cover uh, existing uh, to cover the whole project. And in the event, and this is a question maybe for Betty, in the event that all those <coughs> funds are not used in that project fund budget, <coughs> then what happens to those project funds? Betty Greiner, Director of Administrative Services. It will be set in, into this project fund, and it would have to be used for those two projects. Anything, now you can either direct us now what any um, excess funds would be used for, or to use the excess funds, that we would have to come back to you and ask for your direction on what the excess or where it would be transferred to or what it could be used for. Uh, but, but the bottom line, it's the sheriff's budget. Uh, it is the sheriff's budget now for him to transfer it in there, but right. once it's transferred into a project fund, it has to be used for that specific project unless you amend that. Right. Um, so, but, yes, Commissioner. So why then does this need to come before the commission? Good question. Because it's, the, it's transferring it into a different county fund. The reason it has to come to you is because it's transferring it into a project fund. And so should the county commission choose not to approve this action, what would happen? Approve the transfer? Yes. Then it would stay in his budget and he would have to, uh, he would have access to spend it, um, but not to transfer it into a project fund. But he would be able to enter into contracts for that payment, and maybe even if the action doesn't occur in 2017, if these entered into the contracts that are occur in 2018, he would be able to do that. He would enter into the contract in 17. Um, we could encumber some funds for that, but if it's not, if the service is not started by the end of the year, it would have to come out of his 18 budget. And I guess coming back to and, and sheriff, not that these, not that there isn't a need for a storm shelter at the facility. Um, when we have officers there, we want them to be able to seek shelter as needed. Um, not that there might not be a need for a Wi-Fi access with training. Both of those fit under the umbrella of the training facility. I, my concern comes more from this is a facility that's always been maintained by our forfeiture funds, and not being a burden on the county. Um, and if we have those forfeiture funds available, that, again, having that same mantra, that same philosophy, um, and that's just been my, my concern is, that, again, the bad guys paying for good guys, uh, at, to take your quote. And, and along with that, as, as you said, it, it, we do have the money in our budget, which would be used one way or the other there, but it, we find that this is a, uh, uh, probably the best fit for what we have for the funds that we have right now. And again, uh, as Ms. Griner said, because the project, by the time we would have to let contracts or let the bids on those type of things right there, we'd be into 2018, then we wouldn't have those funds that were available for us right now. Um, I'm going to support establishing the project fund. I, it, the sheriff has his discretion to, to use this money. I, w I wish it was coming from the forfeiture uh, 
but uh, it's it's your call, Sheriff, in the okay. bottom line. So I'll I'll make a motion to approve establishing the forfeiture fund, uh, the project fund. Excuse well, me. I'm in a second, but I would <clears> like a, a, be a mix of funds so there's less burden on taxpayers mm -hmm. than and and look at some forfeiture fund dollars as well for the for the total project. I know this is a not to exceed amount basically, but um, just ask that you look at that those options. Okay, we can look at those. Fortune. Yeah. Okay. Motion made to approve by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Bueller. All in favor say aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries three to zero. Thank, Thank you, Chair. You, Next item, please. Item E, Public Works Solid Waste. Number one, consider approval of request to issue a request for quotation for the processing and recycling of used tires by the department. Good morning, Mr. Tom Blunt, Public Works and Solid Waste. This is a uh, solid waste item. Essentially what this request is, um, we currently have an on-call uh, contractor that when we have tire amnesty events where we collect uh, used tires from folks or we may find them along roadside ditches, we uh, bring them in and when we get a certain amount, we call in the contractor, they come collect them from us and then take them off and process them um, and recycle them. Um, we are at a point where we believe it's, it's uh, well worth our time or well worth it to uh, go out for RFPs once again. Um, to see uh, to make sure that we are getting the best uh, terms and pricing for this service and uh, so that's what the request is for for you today is just to go out for RPS. Uh, we estimate um, based on historical cost um, this would run about four to five thousand per year um, and the funding would come from the solid waste recycling or the solid waste fund and um, as mentioned before since it's becoming from solid waste that is a uh, all user fee based, so there'll be no tax monies involved. So, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Questions for Mr. Blunt? No questions. I'll move approval. Second. Motion made to approve by Commissioner Bueller, seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries three to zero. Thank, Thank you. you, Tom. Next item, please. Item F Human Resources, number one, consider approval of resolution 2017 84, authorizing 2018 step increases for classified and unclassified employees, effective July 1, 2018. Good morning, Commissioners. Angela Lewis with Human Resources. Uh, the, re the resolution and scale would provide for a 1% scale change plus one step increase for each classified and applicable unclassified employee. Uh, to be effective July 1st, 2018. All bargaining units have agreed to receive this step increase as of July 1. Okay. And it's all within the budget? It is all within the budget. I'll move approval. Second. Motion made to adopt the resolution by Commissioner Cook, seconded by Commissioner Bueller. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries three to zero. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Next item, please. Item G, Administrative Services, number one, consider approval of requests for capital improvement funding. Betty Greiner, Director of Administrative Services. As we near the end of the year, it is time for us to look at the capital outlay um, for 2018. The Commission approved in August a budget of $2 million for capital outlay for 2018. I, uh, requested all of the departments to send in their requests to my uh, my department. We shared those with you for you to each review. I have asked the um, department heads of each of the departments that have requests to uh, come up and give you a brief explanation of their requests. Um, I have a spreadsheet here that we will look at and um, as if you want to go ahead and make approvals today we will um, do that I have a column here that we can use for the amounts that uh, you have approved and then up here in this corner is how much you have left of that two million dollars so uh, we will start out by we will just go down the list by the department heads and they'll give you a what I've asked for is a brief ex explanation of the requests so start with the appraiser Good morning, Commissioner Steve Bauman, County Appraiser. Uh, we are asking for um, what looks to be a small amount on this list, 48 chairs and 24 conference room tables to replace the tables and chairs we have in our conference room currently. They're um, fairly old and tired, some broken, scratched pretty bad, and stained. 
this conference room is used uh, by multiple departments. We use it for uh, training, which is generally statewide training, some regional training for appraisal staff, um, as well as planning department uses it for their uh, planning meetings, health department uses it. Um, and it's also a staging area for the public uh, during the appeal season for our office. Uh, the tables that we're looking at uh, would have wheels and, and their flip-up tables, uh, which would be a lot easier for maneuvering and, and setting in the different formats that the different uh, uses require. Uh, and the chairs would have wheels so that um, it will be easily set up by one person or, or some office staff instead of having to bring in a lot of muscle to make that happen. So that's our request, and uh, we hope it's approved. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Steve, Bobby? actually, we do have new carpet in that area yes. as well, and the current tables do not have wheels on them? They do not. They do not uh, the tables and, and chairs do not. And the chairs th that are there, they're really heavy, bulky metal ones, and moving them is a chore. Uh, we just watched uh, the refuse department trying to move chairs over for, um, I think it's refuse, may have been public works, but for their uh, dinner that they were having, and, and the chairs fall off of the, the cart that they use to take them, and it's, they're just heavy and bulky and, and not great okay. use. But. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Next is Department of Corrections. Good morning, Commissioners. Eve Kendall, Department of Corrections. Uh, the agency has three items in front of you today, hopefully for approval. The first one is the uh, air handler for the annex. You might remember that uh, in past years we've gone through and replaced uh, the ones in the jail and at the juvenile detention center. This is over at the annex across the street when we uh, did the refurbish of the uh, printing building. Um, it is uh, almost at its life expectancy. There, the average life expectancy is 15 to 20 years. It's about 10 years old. Uh, we do have other ones similar to this one, but this one seems to be a little more finicky. We uh, Currently, we spend between 3000 to 5000 a year maintaining it. So we don't think it's going to last the 15 years. So we're trying to get ahead of the game to uh, replace it. We've been in co uh, conversation with uh, a couple different companies to see what would be best to make sure that we are getting the right size uh, unit uh, because there is question whether or not the current one is the right size for the amount of air it needs to uh, push, basically. So um, our current uh, budgetary bid is 66 thousand and some change so um, that is our first uh, request and our priority uh, that is that also that um, air handler is for the living units in the annex uh, which houses roughly oh, between 50 and 100 uh, inmates or detainees at a given time right now and can uh, house up to 200 so depending on the fluctuation of our population um, our second one is the uh, transport minibus. Uh, I would like to look at a minibus because it has, it will um, transport more uh, detainees than a van that we're currently using. Our current van is um, a 1999, yes, 99, uh, 350 uh, passenger van that we've been using that we've modified. Um, the, what I'm looking at currently uh, will uh, transport 18 to 20 inmates which would be more efficient for us. Uh, I think in 1999, how many inmates we had versus now, uh, our population has risen, but our uh, transportation has not really. So um, we're looking at, no matter what, even if we are not able to get the minibus, we are going to have to uh, get another transport vehicle because it is a 1999 uh, vehicle that is running its course there. Um, and that current bid for the minibus is uh, 80000 uh, If we end up getting a uh, transport van again, it'll be less. But we'd have to modify that for security needs. So, And the minibus is actually going through a company that, uh, that already does a security minibus transport for other correctional agencies and law enforcement and stuff. So, um, And they uh, were hoping to be able to make sure 
one of my uh, issues is that we make sure that it fits everywhere we need to have it. Uh, and part of the issue is whether or not it will fit in the Sally Port here at the, at the courthouse. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking right now at whether or not we can modify uh, or how much we'd have to modify the opening to our garage door here. Um, if not, then we m I might have to either satisfy myself with a uh, smaller van or uh, look at the needs of uh, raising the uh, lintel there for the uh, for the uh, opening so um, r right now we're looking at eighty thousand dollars for that and probably if not it would probably be sixty for a van and modifying it the third uh, request we have is for a uh, vehicle to for our administrative purposes for training and uh, outside meetings and uh, so on and so forth uh, that vehicle is currently a 2002 Ford Taurus um, it has uh, pretty much ran its life cycle also. Um, we are starting to spend more to maintain and is useful. Um, we have been asked whether or not we would be uh, willing to look at the leasing program uh, that some of the other agencies are using. Um, we are looking at that, but we question because we keep our vehicles so long if leasing would really be a, uh, a, uh, a positive thing or a negative thing. Uh, because we do show that we, we use our equipment as long as we can. Um, so uh, we are looking at the leasing program, but if we would end up buying a new vehicle, it would be roughly $25,000. I stand for any questions you might have, and I uh, look forward to hopefully uh, your approval for these requests. Questions for Eve. Yes, Commissioner Cook. Just on that minibus, again, we don't know if the minibus would even fit in the courthouse Sally Port, and if we don't know what the cost would be to modify the garage, the garage door, the physical facility of the courthouse if we went that route, but we know that we need to replace something. Yes, sir. So we know we need to replace. So if we were to make this a transport vehicle as opposed to a minibus, that might be more prudent, knowing that at 1999 it's reached the end of its lifespan. Yes, sir, uh, and that's why we're doing our due diligence now to make sure whatever we purchase that we are able. We know it'll fit uh, lengthwise and width-wise. It's just whether or not the door will handle the, uh, the uh, height of the vehicle. Um, right now, I think I'm only like two inches short. <laughs> so uh, we're looking if, but the door doesn't raise all the way to the top. So we're looking to see what that option is. Well, outside of Commissioner Archer letting the air out of the tires so we can get in. <laughs> I don't think that'd be a good use of our, our tax dollars, but. <laughs> Thank you for that opportunity, <laughs> Commissioner. Uh, I will point out that, that what we're talking about as far as these capital outlays is a framework, okay? It, it really is just setting priorities. So if, if uh, we approve this, you would still have to come back and fully document and yes, justify the expenditure and, and uh, uh, someone to let air in and out of the tires and that, that yes, provision. So, mm -hmm. that, uh, I mean, I, I want the public to understand what we're really talking about. Yes, sir. We would still need to come forward and give you right. uh, a proposal and so on and so forth. Okay. Very good. Any other comments, yeah. questions? All right. Thank, Thank you, Lee. Thank you. District Courts, Chuck. Good morning, Charles Heidovitz, District Court. Uh, we have two items before you today. I'd like to start with number two, which is the 410 ADA restroom. We'd like to pull that uh, from this uh, particular discussion. Uh, the project is going to be bef brought before the commissioners, I believe, on the 18th, and we can discuss the entire project and funding at that point. As far as uh, the uh, number one item, the jury box renovation, what we plan on doing is demolishing the elevated ramps that are in the identified courtrooms, uh, they are not ADA compliant and they are significant trip hazards. We've had jurors and inmates uh, trip and we've had to have the paramedics called to attend to those folks. So what we would like to do is demolish the elevated ramps. Uh, in doing so, we would be doing some work within each of the jury boxes. Uh, and that small construction will allow us to put a 14th seat within each jury box so that there will now be 14. Right now there's 13 in each of the boxes. And then we'll re be able to reorient them a little bit 
so that the, the jurors will be able to see the evidence, dis, evidence presentation displays that we're going to be rolling out next year. Okay. Questions for Chuck? I do not have any. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Emergency management is next on the list. <clears throat> Morning, Commissioners. Dusty Nichols, Emergency Management. Um, just here to talk about these seven items we have up here. Uh, just looking at the very first one, the EOC kitchen overhaul. Um, you'll see the breakdown in the packet, but it's basically replacing um, the stove that's been there since, well, forever. Uh, I think it's 52 is the date on the back of the stove. So it's been there for a while. It's still working, but it's got to be coming in its life eventually. So uh, trying to do um, some replacement of sinks and so forth. Um, uh, the um, the power plugs, those kinds of things, uh, put the right uh, spec items in there. So that's the uh, kitchen overhaul. Uh, the UAV thermal cameras to support our UAV. Uh, we have a couple of those that we've been called out and used with uh, TPD and the fire department in the past year. Uh, we have those, um, that project or that mission for uh, search and rescue. Um, we help uh, fire with finding hot spots. This particular camera is, is designed to do that, find those hot spots and help out our, um, uh, help in hours of darkness, those kinds of things. Module outdoor warning install at Midwest Aquatic Center is basically putting a new siren out at the aquatic center. Um, and in the packet it has all the details, but it shows that area that it would serve. Um, it also, we're also considering lightning detection uh, in that, uh, that one as well. Uh, the UAV subnet and the radio sustainment. I will let Nelson break that down for you a lot easier than I did. Hi, Nelson Castile, Emergency Management. Uh, the UHF subnet as a uh, repurposing of all the equipment that we got from Dar Department of Corrections when they went over on the 800 system. This would allow us to install the repeaters and the antennas and also uh, also come up with just a little bit extra to replace the batteries. Most of the batteries that we inherited were uh, between eight and 10 years old and they continue to get older. The radio sustainment project and also the radio sustainment alternate, the technology that we're seeing with this 800 system is very expensive. Uh, many of the radios that we have inherited are going to be end of service, end of support, or end of life in the next four or five years. For five radios, which it happens to be priority five, for five radios um, to replace out of the 40 that we need to replace, it will be approximately $36,122 per year for the next 10 years to replace all those radios. That is a large amount of money. And as, and as you know, when, when you leave a car lot, um, the car depreciates pretty quick. You don't even hit the first pothole before the car is depreciated. The radio sustainment alternate, we have found that we have an ability to save some money while also not having to issue folks six and $7,000 radios. This was based on what we looked at last year with the radio system that goes over the internet and can be used via the smartphone applications, the tablet applications, or any of the computer applications. With the 18,000, that gets us two talk groups and allows 60 different people to be on there listening or talking at the same time. The 18,000 then each year as we would add a talk group, we would get an additional 30 licenses. For that amount, looking at the five radios that we're getting, we would increase our capabilities 110% just in the first year based on going to the IP based where we can hand a volunteer a radio that's on their phone or they can use their personal phone. As the uh, licenses are lifetime, we will never have to pay for those licenses again. Um, we have also looked at that in the realm of continuity of operations and continuity of government where we are able to spread folks out if we need to talk radio to radio or phone to phone those options are available there as well are there any questions on that questions for Nelson thank you thank you and the last item on there is the EOC sustainment washer dryer. This would be just a small apartment, <coughs> stackable. Uh, when we pull exercises, uh, we tend to get um, makeup 
fake blood, that kind of thing on our uh, clothes and volunteers' clothes. So we want we wanted to have something handy um, to uh, not damage any equipment and actually kind of keep stuff fresh if possible. Uh, the one thing I will mention: uh, all of these items here are. Um, well, most all these items are multi-use for a multi-use facility. Uh, in our in the um, EOC, we've we've arranged uh, a lot of our classrooms in spaces uh, for the rest of the courthouse to use as meeting rooms, uh, training rooms, so forth. So uh, the EOC kitchen overall specifically uh, goes towards that. The thermal camera camera is actually uh, supporting a piece of equipment we already have, so it's not brand new uh, purchase across the board. Midwest Aquatic Center uh, siren, of course, is. Uh, community that last one the EOC subnet or sustainment washer dryer uh, was kind of a, a specific thing it was a it was a nice um, thought to have but anyway any questions no, I guess not thank you <coughs> thank you Dusty facilities management Good morning, Bill Crow, Facilities Maintenance Director. Um, have 10 items for capital outlay request uh, this year, which still keeps me under John Knight, who has 11. So I want to point that out right off the top. Um, courthouse parking lot renovations. The lot immediately north of the alley uh, between 6th Street and here, the asphalt on that and even some of the curb and gutter is deteriorating at a pretty rapid rate. And our larger lot, uh, on the north side of 6th Street along Monroe has some potholes and things that need to be addressed and maybe a seal or two and that would take care of those lots and hopefully keep them going for another 10 or 15 years for a mill and overlay uh, especially in this lot immediately adjacent to the courthouse. Uh, the second item, courthouse electrical renovation. Um, down in the sub-basement at our transformer uh, earlier this year we had the lightning strike that uh, caused some issues um, we've just kind of been deferring action because it kept us in the same situation we were prior to the lightning strike, but we never did uh, rebuild those circuit breakers that they didn't fail, but they didn't activate properly. And that 40,000 would get those uh, eight circuit breakers up to, uh, up to snuff and working properly. The third item, the courthouse building automation system improvement. Uh, the software system for the um, Allerton system that we use to monitor and control the HVAC in this building and a little bit over at the North Annex. Ten years old and the software on it is starting to slowly deteriorate. Uh, our IT department was able to get us going when we had a little problem earlier this year and an upgrade on that uh, would keep that system operational into the future. Uh, we have two water heaters in this building. They're both electric. Uh, one serves the EOC, the other serves the rest of the courthouse. Um, both of those have sprung leaks. They're not serious at this point. Uh, very slow pools of water uh, and that would replace both of those electric water heaters and make sure that we have hot water when we need it. The generator upgrades, all the work we did on the northwest parking lot, getting the new fuel oil tank, all those things are great and we're moving forward. But the emergency generator after 50 years has never really had an overhaul. And I want to get some money to make sure that that generator would operate no matter what. Um, again, it's kind of a guess as far as the cost. I think we can probably get that uh, generator for less than that. But courthouse steam trap maintenance is an energy item. Um, and the steam traps in this building after 50 years have never really been gone through either. And I'd like to get through as many of these steam traps as we possibly can. Uh, make sure they're not leaking any of the steam and utilizing our energy properly. The door and lock keying system replacement, um, going to lever sets for ADA compliance and re-keying the building for security reasons um, is what that one's all about. We earlier this year did take care of the DA's uh, suite on the north end of the building and he has all new ADA locks and a new system just for the DA's office and that would continue through the rest of the building and give everybody new security as well as ADA. The big item there, the courthouse elevator modernizations, <coughs> uh, visited with two companies to get some pricing on that. That's an average of the two 
of what they said it would cost. Uh, the three bank public elevators that we have in this building, the way it's been explained to me, all have to be modernized at the same time, which is why that price is so high. We can't do them one at a time because of the way they're interconnected. Um, we are slowly but surely modernizing elevator number one right now. We're getting a PC board at a time, uh, and it's still not up and running. So whether that's our eighth priority or not, it's the amount of money uh, is a significant amount of money. But we're going to have to modernize at some point. The last modernization of those elevators was in the mid-1980s when they hit their first 20th birthday. So we're 30 years into a modernization from the 1980s. Um, courthouse building automation system improvements on the temperature control. Uh, that's going back to the alert and system from item three. It would expand that system and give us some more controls and better control of certain areas that are our normal uh, complaint areas. And the last item, the North Annex window installations. Um, the North Annex being a, a Morton building and it has very, very limited uh, glass space right now, very little natural light coming in the building and that would install some windows at some locations which may or may not uh, help facilitate our moves if we uh, decided to do some space planning out there and make some folks happy with office space in that area. Be happy to answer any questions you might have. Questions for Bill? No. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Next is IT. That IT has been pulled uh, because of the uh, that was that was approved to be paid out of their 17 budget. So we will go on to public works. Public works. <clears throat> Commissioners, um, Tom Block with Public Works, Solid Waste. These are all Public Works items, as Solid Waste, again, is not paid out of taxpayers' funds. So this will, um, we only have a request from Public Works. Our first request is to acquire two new dump trucks um, with dump bed, sander, snow plow um, system. The ideal life expectancy for these type of uh, pieces of equipment is 10 years. Uh, the ones we're wanting to uh, replace are both the 2001 vintage um, dump trucks and, and these apparatus um, are by far the most widely used piece of equipment that Public Works um, has um, in its fleet. It uses, uh, we use these nearly every single day um, throughout the year. Um, we have a fleet of these of about 22. Uh, we'd like to replace them on a 10-year cycle if we get into that cycle, so that's why uh, two are being requested. Um, the estimated cost for these is uh, total um, $320,000 net. We're anticipating them to be about $170,000 each with an anticipated $10,000 trade-in value for the ones we will be replacing. Our second uh, priority um, be two new uh, tractors with boom mower attachments. Um, we would look for one to be used in northern Shawnee County and the other one in southern Shawnee County. Uh, the ideal life expectancy for these uh, pieces of equipment is 15 years. Um, the ones we are looking to trade in are both 1999 vintage. Um, they become these pieces of equipment that we are wanting to uh, trade in are getting very expensive to maintain. We're spending about $15,000 per year each uh, in maintenance, and these are used several months throughout the year, primarily. Anytime vegetation is growing from essentially March through October, November time frame, they're pretty much out uh, being used. Uh, these mowers are ones that we use in which you have to uh, reach hard to, hard to reach places like around bridges, maybe mowing, cutting, trimming trees. Um, that's what the, the boom mower attachments are used for. Um, our third priority uh, would be uh, two other tractors with side mount, mower, side mount mowers. Um, again, one would be used in northern Shawnee County and the other one would be used in southern Shawnee County. Um, as, as with the other mowers, the ideal life expectancy is 15 years. Um, one of the 
tractors we want to get rid of is a 1994 vintage and the other is a 1999 vintage. Um, one has 7,000 hours of usage on it and the other has nearly 10,000 hours of usage on it. Um, and these pieces of equipment now are costing us about $10,000 per year each uh, for maintenance. And again, as with the other ones, they are used extensively throughout uh, the majority of the year, basically in March through October, November timeframe. Our fourth uh, request is we'd like to uh, purchase one new low boy equipment trailer uh, to mobilize heavy <coughs> equipment to various job sites throughout all of the county. Um, we do have one trailer right now, um, and that is, is okay if, if all our crews are working on one site, but we, for the majority of the year, we are working in several locations at one time. If we only have one trailer that's suitable for hauling heavy equipment, there is a lot of downtime or wait time to get heavy equipment to, f to various locations. Um, so this, this request is really just to really improve our efficiency uh, for getting work done. Um, um, for our department. Our fifth uh, request is to replace one of the Public Works Administration trucks. Um, the life expectancy for this type of vehicle, this is one happens to be a Durango. Um, the life expectancy is about 15 years. Um, this truck that we're wanting to replace is a 1999 uh, vintage and will have approximately 240,000 miles on it uh, by the time we get rid of it, maybe even more, or maybe a little bit less. But this particular truck, um, this last year in particular, we've started experiencing transmission issues, fuel system issues, um, and it's causing us to actually rebuild quite a bit of the engine. Um, this one's really, really starting to fall apart on us. Um, we will look at possibly into a leasing arrangement for this type of vehicle, um, but we don't, I don't have enough information right now to say one way or another, but um, if that is uh, something that would be preferred, we sure would, could look into that and see if that might be a, a viable alternative. And our sixth uh, request is for a new survey truck. Um, like this, the one we currently have is like a Ford Expedition type. Um, again, this uh, life expectancy for this type of vehicle is 15 years. The one we are wanting to replace is a 2,000-year uh, model, and it has about 190,000 miles on it. Um, and as with the other, with the Durango that we're talking about, we would also look at possibly looking at would this fit into a leasing program. It's hard to say with the type of usage it would get if, if that's something that we would want to be putting into a leasing program. Um, they sometimes can go into some, some fairly rough terrain, um, but that would be something we could sure look at. And with all of these pieces of equipment that we, that we are looking at replacing, they all fit within the capital replacement uh, strategic plan that we have put together. Um, so in any event, that is <coughs> Public Works request. So very good. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to stand. Questions for Tom. Commissioner Cook. Tom, in your memo, you note that Public Works is about five million dollars behind schedule as far as equipment needs. Correct. As far as yes, as and far so as a if the commission was to grant all of these requests, then we're only four million dollars behind. Well, oh you mean if you gave us the whole two million? Yeah. No, you're correct. But I don't want you to do that. <laughs> I might have, I may lose a lot of friends if you did that. <laughs> but last year you granted us about a million and it kept us on pace. Um, but, but you are correct. If you gave the whole two million, we'd be about four million behind next year. So. All right. Okay. Do I have my question? Okay. No, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Security Council. Morning, Commissioners. Dusty Nichols again. I'm here on behalf of the Security Council, uh, which includes Public Works, excuse me, uh, <laughs> Building Maintenance, uh, Finance, um, uh, the Sheriff's Office, so a group of us basically around that council. Uh, what I'm bringing forward today specifically is the security or surveillance system in the courthouse. Not that there's anything specifically wrong with it now, it's functioning, uh, but it is. Uh, coming to end, end of its life as well. Um, 
the only reason I don't have a very detailed um, uh, proposal for you, I think, is basically partly uh, based on time. Uh, working with Bill Kroll and the company, um, I think they were a little bit busier than we anticipated to get that actual estimate. So when we did talk to them, we did speak with somebody who was familiar with the system was in place. Uh, and the, the guidance we got was we can uh, find something uh, that would be a good replacement for what's in here now for 250000 or less. <laughs> That's why that 200000 250000 is on um, the proposal for capital outlay. That's all really I have, unless you have any questions that I probably can't answer. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioners, any questions for, for Dusty? Okay. Thank you. Right, thank you, Dusty. Uh, next is the sheriff, sheriff's office. Excuse me, I might mention one thing on the uh, security system. Mm -hmm. One of the things that Dusty was also going to check into, and I don't think we have an answer yet, is whether this could be phased over a couple years um, to, to do that. But I don't think we have an answer on that yet either. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Betty. <clears throat> well, good morning once again. <laughs> What you have here is uh, on there is an armored rescue vehicle. And basically what it is is just uh, uh, give us an opportunity to put an, a vehicle in our fleet that allows us to respond to emergency situations there, whether it be a man-made or a natural uh, disaster situation or so. And then this right here, uh, we have seen uh, examples of hurricanes and tornadoes and those type of things where we have to respond but we're not able to respond with a conventional type of patrol vehicle or so and at the same time when we're dealing with individuals such as what we probably saw in the news this morning in New York City uh, when we're talking about uh, man-made disasters or critical incidents and we're looking at a vehicle here where we can uh, properly equip our our individuals our officers for safety as well as for the safety of the public right there now I will say that uh, there has been back in, uh, I believe it's 2008, uh, the uh, a regional uh, response was uh, able to buy uh, an equipment, excuse me, a vehicle for officers to respond to certain situations right there. That vehicle is comes to a point where it's coming of age and also of the advancements of what we have in technology of today uh, puts that vehicle pretty much not too antiquated, but it's, it's probably not the best fit for what we have right there and at the same time when we talk about sharing those type of resources right there invariably we run across situations where we work jointly where we're not able to use a vehicle at the same spot or at, at different spots as such as that right there so we're looking for another avenue as well as not just for our own county and those type of things but when other officers uh, situations are responding or asking for assistance there we have something of a resource for that right there so very good Okay. Thank you, Sheriff. Any questions for cool. Sheriff Jones? Excuse me, one other item on this, that we have had conversations on this of maybe splitting these costs um, with some of the costs being paid out of forfeiture funds, either federal forfeiture or state forfeiture funds, um, and some type of a, a split between capital outlay and the forfeiture funds. And that's permissible under the yes. law. Okay, very good. Thank you, thank you, Sheriff. Uh, Parks and Recreation. Which one here? I'm sorry. Was one of these yours? Neither.
for those of you who were, were here at the last County Commission meeting and saw me fumble through this process, you can, everybody should thank Tom uh, or uh, Pat Oblander for these uh, recent IT lessons that I've just got. <laughs> and I'm probably speaking way too soon here. Good morning, Commissioners. John Knight, Parks and Recreation. Uh, uh, I wanted to go through here and provide you a couple pictures and kind of explain some of the projects that we, on our, on our request for the uh, capital outlays. Our number one priority is the adventure course development. Uh, we asked for $450,000. Uh, it may be a little bit less than that, but what we wanted to do was to begin that initial stage, which is uh, to begin to uh, uh, do some things in and around the, uh, uh, the Lake, old Lake Shawnee Swim Beach, uh, cut a hole in the dike, uh, some of the things you see on here, uh, put a little storage building in here for our canoes, paddle boards, those type of things, cut the hole in the dike, move the uh, marina over to here, uh, mm -hmm. and there are uh, several others uh, uh, that you can kind of see around this area and clean these two green space areas up and begin development of uh, that process. Uh, <clears throat> our number, uh, okay, Pat, I need a refresher course. Spoke too soon, did uh, Our number two request is the uh, uh, the old rowing facility building. Uh, it used to be the, uh, uh, ironically, used to also be the Lake Shawnee Bathhouse back in the 30s and 40s. Uh, the uh, Topeka Rowing Association has been in there for a while, and now the uh, uh, another group is in there with rowing. But we think that uh, facility could be turned into a revenue producer, so the net cost of this would be paid for over several years. Uh, this would be phase one of that, which would begin to uh, take care of the insides of that building and make it a, a rentable facility. Uh, the other phases that uh, would come about in the future would be some of the other things that would come from the commissioners, uh, uh, decks, uh, potential amphitheater, some of those type of things. Uh, this is a, an artist rendition of uh, that building. It's it's, econ it's, uh, it's history. Uh, it's one of the WPA buildings. Uh, we'd like to restore it to its original condition and then open up the inside to make it a family rental facility. Uh, it would be even larger than our Reynolds Lodge area now. That give you some kind of idea of what kind of revenues we could produce. Our uh, number three was the Deer Creek Extension Trail. Uh, this is one uh, that uh, we received a grant, 80% uh, grant from the federal government to uh, go that one, little over one and a half miles. Uh, right now the uh, Deer, Creek Deer Creek Trail stops right near the uh, old research plant. Uh, we would continue <coughs> along Carnahan uh, ac across the uh, uh, creek wind around into Dordwood and hook it up to 25th Street. I'm asking for uh, uh, funds to uh, uh, move that Deer Creek extension a little bit further along. Uh, as you can see here, the, the yellow line is the pr proposed uh, Deer Creek Trail. Uh, it gets us under I-70 <coughs> across 17th Street and then kind of winds around and hooks into Dornwood Park. Uh, uh, again, that's just a, a phased uh, project because eventually we'd like to then hook on to wherever that ends, bring that along through the uh, Robinson Family Park and connect that to uh, 29th Street uh, and work with Tom Block on getting that rest of the way out to Lake Shawnee. Uh, girls softball complex. Uh, uh, I don't think I need to uh, re-emphasize the amount of economic development and the boom that uh, the Bettis complex uh, did for Topeka and Shawnee County, bringing teams in from 10 and 12 different states around the area, bringing here. Uh, we could do that same thing and actually provide us a little bit more uh, 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 larger tournaments to come in because it's being a, its proximity to uh, the Bettis complex. Uh, we've begun working with some different groups like the Shawnee Heights High School, uh, the MSP, our contractor who brings all of our tournaments here, has been holding tournaments specifically to uh, collect funds so that we could move along this direction. Uh, uh, there's a, just numerous pr partnerships we've been working on, and this would be to put artificial turf on the, on the girls' field, one and two. And that's a, that's a picture of what we got now. It works great. 
uh, most of the time, but uh, in the spring and fall when we have most of our tournaments, that's when we have most of our moisture and stuff like that. And a big tournament draw is if they're going to drive here from two or three states away, that they know they're going to play when they get here as opposed to uh, uh, sit in a hotel room. I've done that uh, many times myself, waiting for it to quit raining and then drive home. Uh, this would eliminate that. Uh, the Dornwood Sports Fields uh, is uh, uh, a few years ago, two to, to be exact, we did uh, remodel two of their fields. Uh, this remodel would be at the second phase of that in which we uh, do a, 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 another couple or both of the other two fields and put up a restroom facility that uh, uh, sh should all of these get approved, this uh, restroom concession type facility would also serve as the trailhead to that Deer Creek tail that you saw earlier. That's a, a picture of what, uh, the, orig the original master plan for this area. You can see down here uh, on the bottom right there, that's the splash pad. Uh, and the, uh, the field that's on the uh, uh, right side of the parking lot there, that, might, that may end up going away, likely will go away, but the other fields that need to be done would be the, the ones directly to the left of that parking lot there. Those three fields in there eventually will need to all be done. Golf course bridges. Uh, uh, as I mentioned here at the last county commission meeting that I attended, the uh, uh, golf courses are in a revenue revolving fund. Uh, we've been, begun to make some big improvements <coughs> to Cypress Ridge, but this one in particular is a bridge on the Lake Shawnee uh, golf course that's in uh, dire need of repair. Uh, as you can see, there used to be a rail similar to that on both sides. Uh, one, uh, during one of the spring storms, that rail uh, came off. Uh, we put a 4 by 8 lumber on there to keep carts from driving off of there and uh, just recently the other half of that uh, uh, guardrail on the left broke. Uh, there, that, that's another another picture of, of that golf course bridge. Seeing its better days. Uh, 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 I spoke earlier about some improvements we made to Dornwood. Uh, one of the improvements we made to Dornwood a couple years ago was installing a splash pad. We'd like to do that same thing at Oakland Billard. Um, the uh, uh, original estimates of how many people that would serve over at Dornwood, we underestimated that. I think uh, every time I go by there, there is a, a tremendous amount of kids playing in that splash pad. A splash pad versus a community pool, uh, this doesn't need the lifeguards. Uh, this could be opened up earlier in the season, stay open later in, in the, into the fall, and also hours of operation could be extended to just about anything. And I think that uh, that'd be a good investment. That's a picture of the ones that had Dornwood. Uh, we've also, our priority number eight is um, uh, as we're beginning to track some of these teams and as uh, uh, information technology progresses, we'd like to begin to add the Wi-Fi component. Uh, we get uh, numerous, numerous requests, if not from almost everybody that comes out to our Bettis complex that they'd like to have some kind of Wi-Fi connection and it would help us with our uh, uh, tournament monitoring and all of those type of things as well too. The, uh, our ninth request is the Hangar Family Preserve. Uh, this would be phase two. We are currently getting ready to uh, do phase one. Uh, some of those funds could come down quite a bit since we've been negotiating with a, a local company here. Uh, we may be able to take care of some of phase two right into the phase one programming uh, due, due to good pricing. Uh, again, this is a uh, foundation uh, type partnership, uh, at least half of the uh, funds will be donated privately to begin to do that work. Uh, our tenth priority um, is an elevator at the Shawnee North Community Center. Uh, uh, currently, we, uh, we have not had any uh, issues with not having one, except that it doesn't meet the, the current law. We need to put in an elevator at the Shawnee North Community Center so that we can get uh, people from uh, to all floors. Uh, that being said, uh, I will uh, stand for any questions. And uh, unlike Tom Vlock, I know I don't have any friends down this hallway, so feel free to approve all of mine if you would. <laughs> but, I know you don't have, but I know you don't have enough money either. So be happy to answer any questions you may have. 
Commissioner Bueller, any questions for Mr. Knight? Ms. You just had 10. You ended with the elevator. Was there an 11th project? Or oh, the, uh, the 11th project is the field house uh, called for in the master plan to uh, develop out near the Midwest Health Aquatic Center between there and the Cypress Ridge Golf Course. There's so much talk going on right now. I didn't, I did not include that into this presentation because my recommendation would be wait to see where some of the other discussions go on the field house development. Uh, mm -hmm. It may turn out that this be the best place for it, but there are other places in Topeka and Shawnee County it may fit as well too. Okay. I don't think I have enough information to uh, actually put that out yet. Okay. Commissioner Cook, nothing at this point. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you, John. Okay, well, you've heard all of the um, explanations. At this point in time, uh, we have two options. You can either go forward and start making um, decisions or we can, you know, you can take some time and review them and, and uh, approach it at another meeting. I would, I would like to move forward. Uh, I know we've, we've got a discussion of the Expo Center and that's going to be important, mm -hmm. but I think it's important that we set priorities here also. I'd like to at least uh, start the discussion and whether we finalize it or not, Today, um, we can see if, if that's okay. Okay. Um, I want to point out that, that we increased our capital outlay budget to $2 million. Uh, it historically had been $1 million, uh, but, but to address the, the many needs of our community, and, and I'm glad we did that. But we, we have $2 million uh, allocated, and we have requests of about $7.5 million. Uh, so I, I would like to, uh, you know, I don't have any idea what the other commissioner's view is on this. And so I will go through my view and then we can uh, uh, take a look at that, shoot them down, uh, get other ideas, if that's okay. Uh, before, commissioner Cook? Uh, I'm fine with that, but before we begin, two weeks ago, we passed a resolution regarding excess funds of the uh, reserves and then targeting that if there are excess funds, we would have a priority. If we could just go through what those priorities are, because those two discussions may uh, exactly. dovetail together. Exactly. Okay. The, the excess funds could be used uh, in three ways. One would be um, to reduce debt service, and that is restricted based on when we have call dates for, uh, for debt. Um, another one is uh, one-time expenditures such as these that um, do not affect operating expenses going forward and the three third was a, a basically the same type of thing it's looking at one-time expenses that um, are not going to have additional operating expenses um, for the future so there are opportunities even though something may not be funded through the capital outlay if yes. we have excess funds and I know that we're anticipating having that discussion of what to do with excess funds at some future point yes the anticipation right now I believe is at the first part of, of uh, 18 that we would have a discussion on uh, what the excess funds are and, and what they might be used for and I share that with uh, with Commissioner Cook I, and after we see you know what the reserves are after the the first of the year and then we do have a process uh, in place that we can look at that uh, I think that's a good idea because there are a number of, of needs uh, obviously that we have anyway I'll go through I'll go through mine if that's if that's okay just sure. as a starting point uh, at least we'll have something to talk about and uh, the 15,000 is is good for the appraisers office um, and also Department of Corrections, their request, all of those would be granted. I almost think we need to make motions on these, though. Otherwise, we're going to get confused if we, um, if you start to uh, 
So use our same procedure yeah, as applied. As in the budget, budget uh, I believe. So you want I, a motion? Respectfully, I do for, oh, believe sure, that sure. would be the case. Um, okay. Well, motion to uh, grant the appraiser's office I'll the 15000 Second. Motion made by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Bueller. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries three to zero. Next would be, I'll make a motion to um, approve the air handler for the annex, the total amount. Second. Yes. Motion made to approve by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries three to zero. Uh, also, I will make a motion to improve, uh, approve the minibus for $80,000. Do you, would you like me to change that to vehicle so that that way if a minibus is not uh, I, I don't want to say if it doesn't uh, fit with the, the you know if we want to look at a van rather than a minibus we vehicle. could do that vehicle sure okay. and while uh, Betty is doing that again just for those that are watching at home and in the public as a commissioners we are not able to speak to each other outside of this meeting so uh, if two of us were to speak that would constitute a majority being the two of us and so uh, for that reason we don't have the ability to have any communications with each other we don't know what each other's priorities are and so it may be a surprise to you it's a surprise to us too <laughs> okay did you that's why I come to the meetings to be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Is that eighty thousand that yes. you were recommending? Yes, I'll make a motion to approve the eighty thousand for the vehicle. Second. Motion made uh, by. I'm I'm going to vote against this. Okay. And uh, again, uh, I'm glad you did that little bit of explanation. Um, my thoughts would be to um, approve all the priority ones for each department and so I've done my math based on on that um, kind of framework going forward so that will be the reason that I will not be voting for some of these okay very good uh, motion made uh, by Commissioner Archer to approve uh, seconded by Commissioner Cook all in favor say aye opposed no motion carries no. two to one Commissioner Bueller dissenting um, I will make a motion to uh, approve the uh, crossover at the $25,000. Oh, sorry. I thought you were moving <coughs> on to uh, the courtroom. I'm going to not second at this time. Okay. Just a, we may come back to it. I think, we'll, yes, we will. We will address these. Uh, motion dies for lack of a second. Courtroom. Uh, I will make a motion to approve the $75,000 for the courtroom renovation. Second. Motion made to approve by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Bueller. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no motion carries three to zero. Uh, as we heard earlier, the uh, ABA restroom uh, is not currently in play. So I will make a motion to approve the kitchen overhaul from the EOC. Second. Motion made to approve uh, by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Bueller. All in favor say aye. Oppose no motion. No. Car motion carries two to one. Commissioner Cook dissents. I will make a motion to approve the thermal ca uh, camera. Second. Motion made to approve by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Oppose say no. Motion carries three to zero. Uh, I will make a motion to approve the Midwest Aquatic Center uh, warning system. Second. Motion made to approve by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries three to zero. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the uh, UHF subnet in the tune of $15,210. Second. Motion made to approve by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries three to zero. I think um, our keyboard may need new batteries. <laughs> <laughs> it's really uh, struggling here. I don't see that. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't John Knight. <laughs>
motion to approve the radio sustainment project by Commissioner Archer. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. No. Motion carries two to one. Commissioner Bueller, defense. Uh, motion by Commissioner Archer to approve the radio sustainment alternate. Second. Motion made to approve by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. No. Motion carries two to one. Uh, Commissioner Bueller dissents. I will make a motion to approve the washer dryer for the EOC. Motion dies for lack of a second. Uh, yes, please. We have the battery man here. much better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mara. I will make a motion to approve the uh, parking lot renovation for $175,000. Second. Motion made to approve by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Bueller. All in favor say aye. Oppose no. Motion carries 3-0. I'll move to uh, approve the $40,000 for the electrical system renovation. Second. Motion made to approve by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries three to zero. Uh, I'll make a motion to do the system upgrade for $7,500. That dies for lack of a second. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the water heater replacement. Second. Motion made to approve by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. no. Mo motion carries two to one. Commissioner Mueller dissents. Um, I will make a motion to approve the generator upgrade for $25,000. Motion dies for lack of a second. I'll make a motion to approve the steam trap maintenance for $25,000. Motion dies for lack of a second. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the key system replacement. Motion dies for lack of a second. I'll make a motion uh, to skip the elevator maintenance modernization project. I'll make a motion to Approve the automation uh, system improvements for temperature control for 35000 Motion dies for lack of a second. Uh, the North <coughs> Annex window installation, I'll move to approve. Second. Motion made by Commissioner Archer, uh, seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion no. carries. No. Uh, two to one. Commissioner Bueller dissents. Now we're at Public Works. I'll make a motion to approve the dump trucks for $320,000. Second. Motion made to approve by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Bueller. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries three to zero. I'll make a motion to approve the tractors with the boom mower. Second. For $310,000. Motion made by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Bueller. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries three to zero. I uh, will make a motion to approve the tractors with the side mowers for $250,000. Second. Motion made by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Opposed, say no. Motion carries three to zero. Commissioner Archer, yes. if we could scroll to the bottom to see how our tally is. Actually, oh, I don't want to back here's up. what's left. Up that's the, the remainder. On item three, Northeast. I'm voting no. I'm sorry. Oh. No on item three. Okay. Public works. Yes, uh, that motion carried two to one. Commissioner okay. Bueller dissents. Uh, I'll move to approve the 
Leboy equipment trailer okay, for a hundred thousand dollars. Second. Motion made to approve by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. No. Motion carries two to one. Uh, Commissioner Mueller dissents. I'll make a motion to approve the administration truck for $34,000. Second. Motion made to approve by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Opposed, say no. Motion carries two to one. Commissioner no. Mueller dissents. I'll make a motion to approve the survey work truck uh, for $55,000. Second. Motion made uh, by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Oppose no. Motion carries two to one, I assume. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Bueller dissents. The surveillance system, I don't have a motion there. Uh, drop down to the armored rescue vehicle. I'll make a motion to uh, apply $100,000 to uh, that and suggest that the sheriff use forfeiture funds or any other funds he deems necessary if, if that uh, particular uh, piece of equipment is important to him. Second. Motion made to uh, apply $100,000 to that uh, request by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries three to zero. I would like to back up to the surveillance system and make a motion for $100,000. See if that gets a second. My guess is it will not. Uh, I'll move to approve, or second. Motion made uh, by Commissioner Bueller to uh, put $100,000 toward the surveillance system. And you serve on that committee, and uh, I think you're in a position to know. Uh, so I'll second that. Uh, all in favor say aye. Opposed say no. I'll say no, but my no is I think that this is an item that is needing the full amount or if or at least to identify where the remainder will come from. Um, to commit $100,000 without the ability to come up with the remainder I think is kind of key. So. That's my note. And, yep. and I understand it. I, th I think we're sort of ballparking mm -hmm. now uh, mm -hmm. in, it, again, e every project that has, that to come back. has to come back, it has to be uh, justified and documented. Uh, <coughs> but I, I appreciate that. Um, so your total is $1,887,123, which is, uh, leaves 112000 Eight hundred seventy-seven dollars remaining. Um, my my overall view is that uh, after we get through the end of this year and look at our reserves, that we uh, at that time dedicate uh, whatever we feel is is judicial at that point into the Parks and Rec uh, priorities. Uh, I I don't. In my view, I don't know that we need to allocate anything to Parks and Rec at this point. Uh, we, I think we need to address the other issues first and then do Parks and Rec with reserve money, and we have a policy in place to do that. But I'm open to suggestions or ideas from the other commissioners. Commissioner go Bueller. Ahead. You can go first if you yeah, want to, Commissioner ahead. Cook. Commissioner Cook. I defer to my colleague. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Bueller. Um, well, I don't know if, I, I know that the policy that we passed for reser using reserve funds right. were for sp specific reasons. I don't, I haven't done enough research on the Parks and Rec um, projects here to know if those would fit or not. Right. Um, so I was hoping at least we would get the priority one funded, but we do not. Um, so yes. I am looking forward to that discussion and some decisions on using our excess reserves for deferred maintenance, um, in particular with Parks and Recreation, but also with the Expo Center. So I think that there's some possibilities there as well. And I know that's our next discussion, but, right. but that would be a possibility for those funds. Okay. Thank you, and I appreciate that, Commissioner. Commissioner Cook. Well, I if we look at the definition that we passed under the resolution, those one-time expenditures, 
Um, some of those would fit within mm -hmm. that scope for the Parks and Rec. Some may not fit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I, I, we look at some of those things um, as to what, how, what the definition is. I think that as a commission, we should have a priority for um, our physical building here. We have $112,000 left. I would like to dedicate that towards the uh, elevators that we have at the courthouse. Our elevators are quite aged. Um, and again, that kind of falls under, that would also be a possible one-time expenditure that would fall under our reserve fund. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's why I didn't vote for it, because I think that is a, a one-time expenditure. And so, just in, in the same respect as to the surveillance system, the surveillance system would be a one-time expenditure. Could be. Could potentially. be. Potentially. <laughs> yeah. Again, not enough information around that. Right. But yet, I feel it's important to at least do some. So. Um, I agree with you, Commissioner Archer, that a lot of the Parks and Rec activities could fall under the reserve funds, and, and, and perhaps maybe not that it's a no, but it's a no for right now until we get to the end of the year. Okay. Also recognizing that we are not required to commit all $2 million <coughs> today. No. Any remaining funds, could we could have requests throughout the year until the, the funds are gone. Did you have a motion in mind, Commissioner Cook? Well, I think at this point, then, I, we're probably getting close to the end. Uh, motion to move, if, if the commission would allow 100000 to be committed towards the elevator system, I would make that motion. I'll second that motion. Brings it down to twelve thousand. I need the vote. Um, I need a vote on that, sir. Oh, oh, yeah, the hundred thousand. I'll so. Second. Motion made by Commissioner Cook, seconded by Commissioner Archer. All in favor, say aye. Opposed, no. No. Motion carries two to one. Commissioner Buer dissents. Um, any other thoughts? I. This is similar to budgeting. It's very difficult to do. Sure. And uh, again, we, this is a framework. Uh, these projects will come up individually uh, as we move through 2018, and they must be documented. They must be justified uh, for us to move forward and commit the, the taxpayer funds. Okay. Um, okay. I'll make a motion to approve uh, the total capital outlay framework as we have discussed today. Second. Motion made by Commissioner Archer to approve, seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries three to zero. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. We have the, the next item, please. Item H, presentation regarding, uh, regarding the Kansas Exum Center renovations. I will, uh, this is going to be, I think, a lengthy process. Uh, from HTK to introduce us to, to the Expo Center Master Plan. I know we're going to have a number of questions. We're going to have a number of people that want to make comment on it. Uh, so given that, I will make a motion to go into recess uh, for 10 minutes uh, and then come back and, and look forward to talking about the Expo Center. Sounds good. Second. Motion made to go into recess for 10 minutes uh, by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Bueller. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries three to zero. We're in recess. We don't have a gavel, so I'm just <laughs> clapping and, and starting. So, next item of business, please. Presentation regarding the Kansas Expo Center renovations. Morning, Commissioners. Bill Kroll, Facilities Maintenance Director. Um, I serve as co-chair for the uh, advisory committee on the Expo Design, along with uh, Tom Vlock, our Public Works Director. The other members of that committee are Brenda Block, uh, Shelley Bueller, Jim Crow, Betty Greiner, Mary Thomas, Kellen Seitz from the Expo Center, Justin Gregory, 
and Dean Farrell, our construction advisor. And those folks have been tasked with trying to pull this whole thing together to come up with some sort of a master plan for you folks to review today, and that's where we're at. And with that, I'll turn it over to Chuck Smith of HTK. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Chuck Smith, HTK Architects. It's a pleasure to be here in front of you one more time, or probably the beginning of lots of of uh, uh, times here in front of you. Uh, to, to, to follow up a little bit with Bill, uh, the, the advisory committee was put together really in tasks with the notion of, of helping and guiding uh, the design team um, to some type of unbiased and objective uh, review of our process and how we're going uh, to do and answer the problem. And really the idea was we knew going into this that we had a need greater than the monies funded for the project at 45 million, but somewhere in a 62 to 67 million dollar uh, range. And so it was important uh, that we got into a process that allowed us to uh, strategically plan for and come up with a solution for a master plan that would meet really a, a number of criteria. Um, kudos to the advisory committee. Um, countless hours over 400 hours uh, eight to ten meetings if I can remember correctly of their time directly with this process um, and of course I'm sure countless hours with their constituents so I appreciate uh, their commitment to their time um, I also commit uh, appreciate the commitment of uh, Spectra and hit and Kellen's team uh, coming online um, as quickly as they had to come online when we were you know kind of halfway through the process so it was a uh, very instrumental and very uh, much needed to have uh, the operations people online with this part of the process the other people that I want to really quickly introduce is our design team uh, besides our HG architects we're, we have a number of few people here um, we also populace who's our arena and our uh, equine uh, design specialist, Lauber Summers, mechanical uh, electrical engineering, and also information technology. Cook Flat Strobel here in Topeka, uh, civil and site engineering. Walter P. Moore, structural engineers. Uh, Avant Acoustics, and of course CSL, our marketing demand group uh, consultant that we brought online with the project. So, kind of a quick, quick, quick history. So catch everybody up. Um, as we started in this process, the commission commissioners uh, as well rec uh, recognize the notion that we need to make sure that we find a way to properly spend uh, the taxpayers' dollars and find some balance between what is needed and what would bring the best economic return uh, on the money spent as well as some level of, of um, community asset for in terms of um, quality of life. So we really kind of broke that, this process into two two parts part a being the master plan process part b being what happens after we approve a master plan which is the design and construction of of the result of the master plan but more so in part a was the notion that there'd be really two phases phase one would bring on a market demand analysis someone that is specialized in event type of facilities someone that can help guide us through not only what we should do in our local community in terms of quality of life and, and but also evaluate the history of the facility and also go out and start to evaluate what is happening across the nation and in the region and more local to to, to the Topeka or the Expo Center in both uh, scale of event facilities as well as the types of uh, events that are being held there kind of three kind of components came out really quickly uh, you know really kind of the three components of the facility you know uh, land and arena and expo center equine and livestock and other animal shows and then really the site improvements and of course on top of that were the notions of deferred maintenance and then what do we do there so as we go uh, Bill I have Bill Kruger with CSNL come up and spend a lot more time with the market demand analysis and how we went through a process but it's important to know that it was a two-phase process as part of part a one was the market analysis and the strategic planning that went behind it which would then inform the design team uh, where to head with design solutions that design team then made multiple uh, solutions and offered multiple line items and ideas for how to solve the problems and brought that forward to a committee the committee then helped helped refine where and prioritize those lists and as we did that we began to feed that information back to CSL who could then start to do market demand analysis and fees and um, um, sorry 
uh, payback or if you will uh, economic impact as well as community of life evaluation so it was important um, that we do that so with that I'm gonna let Bill jump into the, the time and energy there. <coughs> Thanks Chuck. Good morning commissioners. Good morning. It's great to be back here. Okay. for this. Um, I'm going to go over, uh, we, we, as Chuck mentioned, we, we perform the market, the financial, the programming, and the economic uh, feasibility analysis for this. So I want to go over uh, some of the findings, and, and um, obviously I'm available to answer any questions that you may have. It's a lot of uh, information. CSL International as a firm, we've been around for uh, 25 years. I've been doing this for over 20 years and um, worked all across the country in lots of different markets. Um, a uh, lot, lot of uh, work uh, in recent years in uh, Kansas and Missouri in this particular region. But we deal with any kind of event facility, and a lot of our projects are these multi-component <coughs> event complexes like the Expo Center, where they're doing lots of spectator entertainment events, lots of animal, uh, equine livestock, ag events, um, <coughs> trade shows, consumer shows, and everything in between. Um, you know, the, the one thing that I'm, I'm always struck with is when we look at all the event history of a, of a product like this in communities, you're just struck by the thousands of events that occurred over the years and the hundreds of thousands, and if you tally them with enough years, millions of people that have gone through those doors. And many of them are local residents of the county and um, a lot of them are visitors, you know, that are spending money in Shawnee County in Topeka that wouldn't have otherwise been here. You know, so that's the economic impact in the purest sense in terms of uh, the money that, they, that they're delivering to the community by virtue of them being attracted to an event that's being hosted and, and a product that you've invested in. So our study process, uh, phase one and phase two, Chuck kind of outlined uh, some of the intent of all this. Uh, the phase one is really the most um, involved process that we, uh, that we take a look at, the most time intensive part of that, which is really drilling down to understanding what is the Expo Center project doing today, what is it historically done in terms of events, uh, attendance, occupancy, event mix, um, its current financial operations, um, economic impacts as it exists today. And then we're doing um, outreach uh, to both past customers, current customers, and potential new customers in terms of event activity to understand if there's uh, what, what the market opportunities are, what the market potential would be for expansion, improvement uh, type projects. And so all that is really, you know, the f part of this phase one, which is two thirds of our initial effort. So I started with the kickoff meetings and tours uh, of the building, sitting down with um, the previous management administration and also the current uh, management team that's in place, uh, looking at all their historical data and uh, past event levels, understanding you know their uh, insight into the, the facility challenges and opportunities that might that they might have, and then we looked a lot at the local market. Uh, obviously, thought about uh, how this destination, this community and its assets and infrastructure is set up to accommodate additional investment in the Expo Center, should that happen. So uh, expansion and, and transportation and hotel package and population and demographics, all those kind of uh, statistics like that. Um, and then we uh, made sure that we understood the competitive framework of the, of the facilities that is the Expo Center is competing with within the state, within the region. Um, and uh, around the country for, for certain types of events uh, that are more niche oriented. Um, certainly that competitive region can, can be uh, more expanded, making sure that we understood about that. And then lastly, kind of looking at the comparable facilities across the country. You know, what, what other facilities like this exist in other markets that we can learn something from? And so we did a lot of benchmarking uh, activities and efforts with respect to other uh, uh, case studies around the country. Uh, but importantly, the market surveys, so the interviews that we did, we did, we did um, uh, close to 100 uh, completed telephone interviews and in-person interviews um, uh, at the outset of the project, um, uh, representing hundreds of events that are both past events, current events, but importantly, new events that we don't currently have. And the real question is, if we had improvements or something different with respect to the Expo Center, maybe bigger, uh, maybe different amenities or different facilities, um, you know, how might we be able to compete for your business? You know, so you're, you're, you're focusing on the existing product, what the potential product could be, but also just the, the nature of the destination. You know, what's, what's the interest in bringing uh, an event, if you're a non-local event of some sort, a trade show or a, a equestrian event or a, or a livestock event or an entertainment event, you know, to, uh, to Topeka, you know, for, for, 
for, for a potential new event should the facility meet your needs. You know, you know, so we got lots of great feedback from a wide variety of different event types uh, with respect to those kind of questions that, uh, that really fed and, and informed our, our market conclusions. That all ended with that market building, the market supportable building program where we've outlined, um, this is kind of setting the budget question aside for a second, but it's really focusing in on um, what is the supportable mix of spaces and square footage and, and uh, the components and characteristics of the complex that best meets in the market. And so we've outlined that. And then at the end of that phase one, and again, as Chuck mentioned, um, then we worked with the design team and we, we came up with different types of prioritization of elements that would fit within the context of that market supportable program overall. And then um, uh, based on uh, you know, collaboration with the team and with the committee, um, coming up with a set of different scenarios, which then we ran through this phase two cost benefit. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, impacts on financial operating characteristics you know what would be the impact on the bottom line you know what, what's the ability to drive new revenues uh, contain expenses or are expenses going to grow what's the bottom line to the county in terms of deficit or subsidy required uh, as you know this 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 complex uh, does run at an operating deficit um, across the country that's very typical I mean it's nine out of ten of these buildings typically you know, are running at an operating deficit, uh, you know, uh, consistent with the levels that, that you're at. You know, with an, your aging facility and a larger facility, you're a little bit on the higher end of that right now. Uh, but as you'll see at the end of this phase two cost benefit, um, the, the, the estimates that we're projecting would then, with the improvements and the enhancements, would then put you more uh, in line and even better than, than other like complexes in terms of um, financial performance. Okay. So um, a lot of these charts I, I'm going to go through relatively quickly and kind of get to our conclusions because I certainly want to um, you know, open up to any questions that you might have and, and certainly the, the design team wants to get, uh, get to some of the concepts and some of the opportunities you might have from the uh, execution side of the equation. The Expo Center, you know, we work very closely and analyze all the historical operating details. As you can see there, um, you know, just a lot of activity running through that building. And, and a lot of times these kind of complexes don't get their fair share or their fair recognition within the community about what productive assets they are, you know, for quality of life issues, for hosting local events, mm -hmm. for making you a more complete community or destination, um, but then also driving economic impact and, um, and uh, all those kind of things. So, you know, more than 400 events per year, uh, you know, driving close to 400,000 um, attendees through the door um, every year. It's, it's a very, uh, been a very successful uh, uh, product uh, um, in, in its history. So we looked at competitive facilities of different types, you know, looking at the competitive region of facilities. These are equestrian livestock oriented facilities that compete uh, significantly within those arenas. Of course, you've got American Royal and you've got the uh, Lancaster Event Center and Tulsa Expo Park. Uh, we made sure that we understood what they're doing and what markets that they're um, competing uh, within. Uh, we looked at exhibition centers, so the flat floor venues, you know, those concrete floor venues that are doing conventions, conferences, trade shows, amateur sports, those kind of facilities like that. And we've got another list of those facilities. Again, as you might expect, a lot of them located, you know, in, in the larger, uh, large metro areas and, and, and downtown areas of certain cities. And then spectator entertainment venues, um, you know, uh, based on all these event uh, um, segments, the spectator entertainment segment in particular, there, there is, as you might expect, a significant competition of those state of the industry, spectator arena, sport entertainment venues located in a number of your regional set of cities. And so that's always um, an important factor when you're thinking about a relatively small um, population of promoters that control a big chunk of the touring marketplace in terms of concerts, family shows, ice shows, those entertainment acts that are routing around, you know, and so to the extent that you've got within fairly close proximity, you've got, you know, your downtown Kansas City properties, you've got the, the Independence <coughs> Arena, 
Um, you've got, you know, the Wichita facilities and things like that. It's a very competitive market. And the industry overall, in terms of touring concert industry, has dramatically changed in the last 10, 15 years. And so we have to, you know, we, we have to be cognizant of that in terms of thinking about the priority list of things that we could potentially do at the Expo Center, all else equal, just in, in the sense of um, understand where the return on investment is and why are you investing in something and is that really going to drive a ret the return that you're expecting. So the market surveys and interviews, I've already talked about what we did here. Um, you know, we had surveys of groups that represented over 500 plus events and kind of broke down different event categories and had lots of very informative telephone conversations and some in-person uh, interviews with those folks. Got lots of great feedback and um, uh, lots of data with respect to interest and, and what types of things they would like to see in any potential expansion improvements. These are just kind of a list of the different types of groups that we talk to. Um, th that'll be in the, the packet of information that you've also got. The entertainment event is a fairly small segment, but again, that relates back to what I said before, which is it's a fairly small population that controls the majority of the market for those touring entertainment acts. And so we did talk to all the major players on, on the entertainment side of the equation and got good feedback from them. So this is kind of just jumping now right to the conclusions of the market demand. And um, it's, it's, it's our recommendation that um, <clears throat> one thing a lot of communities kind of fall into the trap with when they're thinking about a, a certain event complex and they're thinking about expansion. Uh, you know, one trap is often try to reinvent the wheel or go in a completely different direction in terms of what your brand, what your product is. You know, our suggestion in this case, is, which is validated by the, the interviews and the market research that we did, which is uh, you should really embrace your strength. You know, embrace the brand strength that you've got right now and the history and the, um, uh, all the events and the, and the visibility that you've got within some of your core segments. And so <clears throat> that doesn't mean that you can't improve your ability to do other things, you know, penetrate better into sports and entertainment and concerts. Certainly you can do that, but don't turn your back on uh, core business such as the equestrian, the livestock, and, and the ag type events. You know, uh, the type of facility that you've got is located in such great proximity to the core of downtown for an ag equestrian ag complex or multi-purpose complex. You know, if you were a, a, a facility that was trying to optimize itself first and foremost only for concerts, let's just say, where would you go? Well, you'd probably drop that arena, as an example, in the middle of a core of a downtown, you know? Um, in this case, you've got land and arena. You're still close enough to downtown where you could still pet, you could still tap into new opportunities to enhance and to elevate your product quality to state of the industry standards without having to scrap it and build a brand new arena. So I think that the foundation with Landon is certainly there, but I'm just saying that the rest of the pieces too, you want to make sure that you're embracing your brand's strength um, as you're moving forward. Um, expansion of exhibit space. Um, we didn't find an overwhelming need from a return on investment to um, uh, significantly expand the amount of exhibition space that, that you need in terms of flat floor, concrete floor space. Um, there, there is a recommendation to enhance and expand on the, the animal and the dirt events, so the equestrian, livestock, ag type facilities, which we'll kind of show you here shortly when the uh, design team kind of walks back up and walks you through some of the scenario uh, options. Um, and then the broader strategy, which is always something that we, that we always want to make sure that it, it, it receives emphasis, which is you don't operate in a vacuum. You know, your expo center complex is, is in a certain location, and right now you've got some pretty um, significant challenges with respect to walkable amenities, right? And it's it, it kind of based on the nature of that kind of a complex. You've got a lot of parking, you've got a lot of spread out facilities, and a lot of acreage. But to the extent that you can think about a larger long-term strategy in terms of incentivizing and zoning and growing and motivating additional types of hospitality and visitor-oriented amenities around the area, that's hotels, that's restaurants, that's retail, you know, um, nightlife and some of those kind of things, you know, they certainly have to have demand generators that go outside the Expo Center activity itself, of course, to facilitate that, or some types of 
you know, public-private partnership strategies to incentivize some kind of things like that. But I'm just saying that you can't just focus on the box. You got to think about the big picture about the the mixed-use district and what the long-term vision for that is. So everything can create some synergy. I mean, around the country, there's as much effort being put into products like this of any type, any kind of event facility product that goes uh, outside the box as much as inside the box in terms of emphasis, right? So that's, you know, uh, having money within a budget to think about public-private partnerships and incentives and mixed-use districts and <clears throat> creating that compelling destination where people can come. There's other things for them to do before and after events and it can be work synergistically with the rest of the businesses and and residents uh, residential nature outside the district as well you know so that, that's just one thing i'll just leave with you in terms of what what our recommendation would be too is, is make sure that you've got a strategy along those lines moving forward so the market demand uh really focused on coming up with at, at least initially at the end of our phase one four different um scenarios. Um, the first scenario would be more or less the base case, which is that option original scenario one, which was the deferred maintenance only. So the theory is if we're looking out 15, 20 years into the future, what are some of the minimum things that need to happen just to maintain nominal safe conditions in the complex and normal status quo operations of the complex and there's typically a, a you know a long list of deferred maintenance items and certain capital repair improvements that will become forthcoming in the in, in the near term that will need to be addressed and so that's just kind of the the original scenario one which is kind of represents our base case um, to be able to compare cost benefit with with the other scenarios the original scenario two with with the equine emphasis so the more of, of the focus with with the limit with the budget that, that was outlined by Chuck, thinking about how could we maximize improvements and, and um, focus on the equestrian uh, livestock ag, the dirt, the animal kind of uh, activities. Um, it, so that really represents the scenario two equine. Scenario three would be more of the focus on the entertainment sports. So land and arena and the entertainment focused, uh, the arena focused emphasis. You know, because certainly w with an arena, as you can imagine by attending concerts and sporting events and bigger cities like Sprint Center and, and some of the other places where you walk in there and it's it looks different than Landon does. I mean, just fundamentally, you know, the state of the industry has progressed um, pretty significantly since Landon was originally built. And we're talking premium seating, we're talking, uh, the, you know, m more, much more robust retail and food and beverage operations within the building, lots of sponsorship opportunities, all those kind of things like that are just uh, a little bit different level than what Landon's got. So those are big ticket items though normally when you're talking about creating that state of the industry, um, especially within an existing building. So a, a lot of that scenario three would say really just focus primarily on, uh, on the arena and let's just see where that gets us in terms of uh, performance outcomes and cost benefit. So a, a few other charts here just started to show some of the modeling. Uh, the recommended scenario, I'm sorry, I kind of skipped over that. The top one, the recommended scenario. Then the thinking was once we develop scenario one, two, and three initially, then the thinking is, okay, well, can we kind of have a little bit of the be best of, of all worlds by taking um, the, the, some of the highest return elements or the most productive elements of scenario two and three within the context of our budget and create more of a balanced approach. So you're paying attention equally to entertainment sports, meaning Landon, and then also um, on the equestrian livestock ag side of the equation. And, that, and that's, again, the, the, the recommended scenario, which, will kind of, which, which, was, which was come to the, a decision on that at the end of our phase two, which we'll kind of get to. But, but we're just highlighting that right now as kind of the balanced approach being the most um, um, prudent opportunity, you know, based on, on the budget and, and all the work that our team did. So the annual number of events, um, you know, you just you, we break them down. This is part of our modeling process to start to get a handle on performance and attendance impacts and financial operations and economic impacts and cost benefit. This is starting to model this out. And as you can see, the recommended scenario, which again has some emphasis in both um, the question livestock animal side of the equation, but then also the entertainment, the land and arena side of the equation, you've got 
you know, a, a, a jump up over kind of the base case. If you remember, the base case was a little bit less than 400 events per year or, or, uh, or so, and now you're looking at a jump under the recommended scenario up to 533. You're getting more bang um, and more productivity within the equestrian livestock animal uh, segments, but you're also being able to be more productive and, and more the, the entertainment and the sports uh, side of the equation too as well. And you're looking at annual event days. This is some of these days are multi-day events. You know, you've got a number of these equestrian livestock animal events that are multi-day events. So instead of just counting them as one event, you actually count the number of days that their show is running, right? So that's that's what the annual event day number shows you. And you can kind of see now um, when you think about return on investment or economic impact that could be generated. You know, those kind of, of activities have much more bang for your buck. The equestrian livestock animal, the trade shows, um, some of the entertainment events, then let's just say community ice, a great public good opportunity, you know, for the community to, to, to have uh, ice capabilities for, for youth and, and, and open skating and, and, and peewee leagues and things like that. Um, we're still assuming that, but in terms of economic impact, you know, some of those other events that are the multi-day events that are bringing in non-locals, um, can start to add up in terms of significant incremental impacts. So attendee days, we're looking at, if you can kind of see here, scenario three is <coughs> roughly equivalent to, scenario, to the balanced scenario. And the important thing, though, is, is even though you're talking about roughly the same attendance levels that are projected for this arena emphasis versus the balanced scenario, as you'll see here shortly, the economic impact under the recommended scenario is larger because a lot of the events that are being driven under this arena emphasis scenario would be those that are being more locally oriented, would be people that are local residents that are coming to an attend a concert or a, you know, a family show or something like that in the arena or some sports event of, of some sort. So um, just keep that in mind when you're looking at that. This is the net new direct spending. So the annual direct spending, this is the first part of the economic impact analysis. We only attributed economic impact projections to those people that don't reside within the county. So uh, the, the assumption would be for conservative purposes, you don't want to count spending by someone who lives within the county if they'd attend an event at the Expo Center because the theory would be is they would have otherwise spent their money in the county on something else, right? So that's, that's kind of the, the, the economic impact theory of, of counting visitor spending for people who are drawn to the county um, and the money that they spend as part of their visit. So you can see here, the direct spending is highest with the recommended scenario, the balanced scenario, um, and it gets a little bit lower as you go along the line. This is kind of our summary of all of our economic impacts, and the bottom line is, you know, from our analysis, the recommended scenario, the balanced scenario, really returns the highest um, um, impact in terms of economic activity, direct spending, indirect spending, induced spending, jobs created, tax dollars generated, and we do, relative to other projects that we've, we've looked at, we, we do feel that the return on investment is significant in terms of, of the benefit provided by virtue of the type of budget that you're talking about. And lastly, my last slide that I've got, and I'll turn it back over to Chuck, <coughs> is uh, the financial operations. So if you recall, well, I don't know if I said this, but your, your current financial operating deficit is about $1.2 million dollar operating subsidy that's required to maintain the operations. You know, if you just take a look at net operating revenues, less operating expenses of the complex itself, it puts you at about a $1.2 million deficit. That's consistent with other projects around the country. However, it is a little bit higher, you know, all else equal for other facilities uh, and other complexes, but it's not atypical. Um, what we're looking at in terms of improvements by being able to drive more revenue, more bodies into the complex, more events, um, and some improvements in the efficiency of the building, um, operating revenues um, for most of these scenarios, except for the scenario one deferred maintenance, are projected to operating expenses is not grow as high as the operating revenue impacts. So we're really looking at, uh, you know, an improvement to the tune of, um, you know, based on our projections in a stabilized year of close to, you know, cutting your, your deficit in half, ideally, you know, under the balanced scenario. So an investment in the balanced approach um, we, we feel could significantly improve your financial operating subsidy requirements uh, on an annual basis. You know, part of that also is the fact that now you've got a new management team in on board. Um, 
they're incentivized a little bit differently. You know, they, they've got some additional creative approaches to driving new revenues. And, you know, I just talked to Kellen uh, earlier today, and he mentioned that, you know, you've got, they've got two of their own in-house promoted events happening here shortly. You know, so, so those kind of a things and those strategies and those creative approaches and thinking to driving revenues, we feel um, is the timing would be good with an improvement uh, product, too that's consistent with the recommended scenario of the balanced approach and you can kind of get the best of the management strategies and then also the building product and infrastructure that would be better optimized and better elevated to, to uh, state of the industry standards in, in many respects. Those are my formal comments. I'm going to turn it over to Chuck now. Unless there's any questions I can answer, we can get, certainly circle back when you get through the rest of the okay. design discussion. Back to you, Chuck. <laughs> so yes, as, as Bill explained, there was a number of priorities that evolved throughout this process, and this list here uh, basically generates those priorities. And they're also listed per section or per uh, category in, in a pri in priority. And you can see over on the far right-hand side, there is an entire column that is un unmet needs. So those are, those are the needs that um, with some pretty tough discussions and some and helpful guidance through a market demand study helped us decide what what types of components and elements and features needed to be funded in the $45 million and what, what would potentially be not funded as part of this $45 million project. Um, I could read every one of those if you'd like me to, um, uh, but there's a number of them. Um, and I think as we go through the plans a little bit, we'll, we can summarize, and you know, I think everybody will get a fairly good idea about that. So with that, I'm going to have Charlie uh, with Populous come up and speak uh, about uh, these plans. I think it's important, as Bill um, pointed out, that these weren't done in a vacuum. Uh, so as each one of these deferred options, scenarios that he put up came to us, we came up with a number of options and a list of costs for each and every item that uh, came out of that and how those would weigh out and how that would be put together and then we were able to take that information and prioritize uh, with the help of the committee to move around and find the balanced plan so this represents the balanced recommendation thanks Chuck um, thank you all for the opportunity to be here with you today and uh, what I'd like to do is just I'm going to give you kind of an overview of, of uh, the plans and and some as they reflect the recommendations of uh, both CSNL and also uh, some some uh, long hours of, of debating and and researching and studying a lot of different options in order to prioritize these items into the recommended plan that we have here. Uh, one one thing I'd really like to point out right at the at the beginning is something that uh, a question we we. Uh, have received quite often is uh, related to some of the organi organization of the site uh, and why we place some items in, in certain locations and wanted to point out real fast one of the one of the critical discoveries that we had was this uh, floodway and flood plain encroachment into the property uh, and a quick description of what that is the the flood way that you see in the uh, in the purple color <laughs> is is actually a no build zone that is uh, an area that is subject to flooding where through FEMA regulations and, and other regulations uh, we, we cannot build anything in that zone. Um, the blue floodplain is a plain where we can build within that zone however it's subject to um, meeting certain criteria and the new facilities that are added into the to the site have to be raised up out of the floodplain level so the finished floors have to be raised at, at, at sometimes it can be extreme cost the the more you have to raise the the floor of the building up and this uh, this diagram does not indicate the the full extent of the floodplain well i see it doesn't a dash right here i don't think this will work on that tv but uh oops. the um so actually all of the new buildings that you see in, in red on this map are within the floodplain. And the floodplain is sloping from Landon and Domer down towards the creek. So the closer we can keep those buildings to the existing facilities, the less expensive they're going to be to construct because we have to raise the floor the least amount. Uh, so that was, that was a, a significant consideration among others. 
what I'd like to walk you through on the site plan then is that uh, from a site planning perspective, circulation was really important to us. And there's some challenging circulation that takes place when you have uh, a lot of spectator entertainment events, uh, things like a concert at Landon or a graduation. And then you have the equine livestock events, which require a lot of vehicular circulation for big trucks and trailers and, uh, and load in and load out of the barns and other facilities. So we wanted to try and, and resolve some existing issues with circulation, uh, some, some critical issues along Western Avenue um, at, the, um, at the top of the site plan here. We have some very critical issues that we believe are our safety concern with, with uh, parking along the Domer complex at Western and trucks and trailers pulling in and out of that street. So we did a lot of research into that. We tried to determine different options, and uh, and we, we we cannot control the flow of traffic on that street because of, of certain variables. So what we decided to do instead was try to create a partition along that street and create two load-in, load-out lanes that allow uh, event participants for the livestock and equine facilities to have, have curbside pull-up and drop-off spaces uh, but no longer to have parking in and out of that space. And so that was a tough decision because we did lose some, some parking that, that's really prime parking for those uh, competitors. And we lost some RV spaces there, but we felt in the long run that the safety of the competitors and, um, the, and the conflict with the traffic flow on Western there was something that, that we had to make a tough decision to try and resolve. So that's one uh, key element of this plan, I think, in terms of circulation. Uh, the location of the two new buildings, you can see we have a uh, covered arena facility proposed to the, um, to the uh, let's make sure I got my direction right, to the south of uh, Domer and uh, to the south of Landon we have a new stalling facility. Now the size of these two facilities was determined based on recommendations from the CSNL study. Uh, what we understood from, from them is that we needed to try and hit a stall count for, for the maximum uh, equine event uh, uh, v uh, venues that were required for the uh, the numbers that CSNL was projecting was uh, between 450 and 500 stalls. We have a little over 240 in the existing stall barn. And while we did look at potentially building all new stalls in the equine heavy scenario, uh, in the balanced approach, we ended up stepping that back and deciding that we're going to try and find uh, a way to renovate the domer. Uh, and uh, existing barns and existing covered arena facilities and preserve those 240 stalls. We've actually enhanced that to create a little better flow within that barn and, and add a few extra stalls and then build a new facility that, that brings us up to at least 450 stalls total on the site. And we thought that was the best balanced approach. In terms of circulation, we need to be able to circulate, or competitors need to be able to circulate 360 around that new stall barn. That's going to, that's, that's sort of an industry best practice and, and something that we wanted to accommodate. So we've created circulation around the, the stalling facility here. And that is the primary reason why we moved that facility inboard into the site instead of some of question why is that facility not here where the covered arena is and the the primary response to that question is that we didn't want to recreate the conflicts we're having at western by trying to accommodate 360 circulation around another facility right on western so that was a that was a really critical consideration and another opportunity that we saw from the CSNL recommendations is that this uh, stalling facility needs to be, and as I mentioned even in our um, early on uh, interview with, with the uh, commissioners, that we need to be considering these as all multi-use venues, not just a stall barn. And so the, uh, the advantage to this location for the stalling facility is not only that it has full circulation interior to the site for the competitors, but it also is functional as an expo uh, exhibit facility that could complement events taking place in the Landon Expo uh, complex. So 
the idea is that inside of this facility we are able to accommodate uh, a trade show booth basically on the same grid as a um, as an equine stall layout and the stalls can be removed the facility is is multi-use so we're, we're building a lot of square footage that's really functional for uh, changes in the market over time and also for um, uh, flexibility of operations here the um, uh, other changes that we've made that we're looking at, and I'll show you these plans in a little more detail, but in terms of circulation, we've adjusted some of the circulation at the uh, entry, the, the existing entry into Landon and the Expo. We've created a little bit more effective uh, drop-off lanes in that area. We've taken out the uh, parking kiosks in coordination with Spectra. They've given us some great recommendations about how they think they can improve the efficiency and the capacity even of the existing uh, parking areas and so that's um, that's something that that we still need to study a little bit more some of that's um, going to take some investigation as we get further into the more detailed planning phases of the project but um, in terms of uh, the impact of parking spaces we believe that uh, that what we're losing with the new facility here can likely be offset by striping of the parking lots in a more efficient manner as well as the the other improvements that are included in the in the site uh, uh, renovations that are proposed as part of the um, part of the uh, budget for the project uh, what we've done is also proposed a new um, RV it's a multi-use it's a RV and car parking area that's over here across from the fire station you can see that that's been shaped in here right now to try and, and fit into available space within this floodplain uh, what we understand for the floodway is that we're, we're not even allowed to build parking in that in that zone uh, there, there's there is some potential with extreme vetting through FEMA and other government agencies but it's it's highly unlikely that we're going to to have approval of additional parking in the floodway so we've tried to utilize available space within the floodplain to expand our parking and RV capacity as much as possible and the way that we've designed that uh, is utilizing a, a strategy that, that we've used at places like uh, the Tulsa Expo Square where we can have a dedicated uh, secured fenced RV facility for competitors uh, holding I think we're we're up to around 56 RVs in there uh, right now but also that area could be opened up and those RV parking spaces could be used as overflow car parking and that would reduce at the times when this centerpiece is used as overflow car parking we'll get about 126 additional car parking spaces there uh, although it will reduce uh, RV parking in the central area and so we have about 26 spaces left now I think that's something that in terms of precise numbers we're going to investigate further as we get into the refinements of the design process and, and I think there may be some ways to actually create more efficiencies there but another consideration we have in that space is also to try and maintain some greenway we have the um, the community trail coming along the river down here and we have some great green space that's adjacent to these parking areas we also feel that there's some advantages to preserving that green space uh, uh, in the floodway along the parking areas and not getting too tight with parking against the trail down here by the river because there's opportunities for for having an event zone in that green space that's adjacent to the uh, parking areas so an uh, uh, example of that might be a motorcycle rally that would be in conjunction maybe with our um, uh, 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 adjacent property down here, the Harley shop that has some amazing new Evil Knievel exhibit, really awesome uh, historic Harley event. And, and we understand that that, is, uh, that that shop is on the map for, for uh, motorcycle tours crossing the country. And so we want to be able to to work with those type of uh, facilities that are around the site as Bill mentioned trying to capitalize on entertainment and retail opportunities that are around the site to provide additional amenities uh, for competitors that are and, and spectators that are coming to particularly to multi-day events here that are looking for things to do and places to walk to and uh, and we see that as a 
record an asset. Um, so I'm going to, um, uh, I guess one other thing I, I want to point out here is that we have actually, um, we fenced the maintenance compound over here. We're looking to try and create a dirt storage facility, which, which currently is not in the budget. That's an alternate in the, in the budget right now. But uh, looking f towards the long-term planning of the facility, having a fenced uh, maintenance space that would be able to utilize, uh, be able to keep the dirt storage and maintenance facilities all uh, concentrated into one area with a nice screened fence. I think that's going to be a big uh, advantage to the facility over time as opposed to having all that exposed. Um, and in addition to that, we've also identified some covered connectors because we want to make sure, uh, if at all possible, we can provide covered connectivity between all of the venues. And so we see a multi-day equine event utilizing, of course, the new um, stalling expo facility as well as the domer complex as well as the covered arena. So trying to provide covered connectivity. And then we uh, see Landon as coming into play as an additional arena space um, during uh, large events. So, so we proposed a potential cover uh, that connects Landon to the rest of the equine livestock um, multi-use venues. Um, so I'll walk you through a little bit of what we've looked at at um, Landon Arena first. Um, you know, Landon, we felt like it was really important, it's, it's really important for, for the residents of Shawnee County to see some significant improvements in Landon Arena. Uh, they're making a, a significant investment and we want to make sure that, that this facility, which is their facility, we, we heard uh, in no uncertain terms that this this is not just an event ROI type venue this is a place for the community to gather and uh, as such we need to consider carefully amenities and upgrades to this facility that are going to m allow this building to to continue to serve and to even serve better the the residents of the of Shawnee County and also to create uh, a great um, uh, space where visitors to the county and to Topeka from uh, from elsewhere coming for entertainment or uh, or sports events here can um, uh, see a really great face to uh, Shawnee County so uh, we've uh, identified ways that we can make investments that are really key that's how we prioritize some of the investments that we're making here <laughs> in addition to trying to take care of deferred maintenance and uh, probably the biggest, most significant change to the look and appearance of the building is that we're proposing a, um, a large new entry structure that is located right uh, in the area of the current uh, entry between Landon and the Expo. But the goal here is to create uh, indoor access on the, on the surface level so you can walk from your car you don't have to walk up a giant staircase <laughs> you open the doors you go inside and and then you have the option of using stairs or an elevator to get up to the concourse level uh, and that expansion also allows us some opportunities to create some additional concession areas and and customer amenities uh, that the uh, that the customer would would be uh, able to utilize as they come up into the space um, we've also proposed renovations to the locker rooms, existing locker rooms, because that's, uh, we understand, is a critical amenity towards uh, uh, enhancing the experience and the opportunity for youth sports or uh, tournament events, things of that nature, uh, as well as uh, creating some space that's a little bit nicer for your uh, entertainment acts and, and green room type areas. Um, let's see, uh, expanded restrooms was a big consideration and of course uh, accessibility to the overall facility, making sure that we're meeting modern accessibility standards and having uh, enough restrooms and refreshed restrooms to, uh, to be equivalent with what other people are experiencing at other, what people are experiencing at other venues uh, like at the Sprint Center or other places, you know, we want them to um, to walk into to, to these facilities and, and feel like it's a modern a new space. Uh, on the uh, upper level of Landon, what we're proposing is to uh, replace all of the existing seating with a new chair back seating product that would have a padded seat. Uh, it would be a product that could be washed down. Um, 
So uh, we're also trying to consider the cost of operations, labor and operations uh, for m maintaining and managing the facility as well as, as uh, the um, amenities for, for the fans uh, because there's a, obviously a cost impact to that. Uh, we've proposed some limited uh, additional uh, seating products in here such as a loge seating product where you could have food service in a um, you know, loge box space and also a uh, club seating space at the end of the arena which is a a space where there would maybe be a bar or uh, a different type of entertainment experience that uh, is different than the seating product. So people come and they and they gather around there, and uh, it's a little it's <coughs> like a social space within the uh, arena. That's becoming a extremely popular uh, amenity in in modern arena and event facilities. And we can achieve the loge and the uh, and the. Um, uh, bar club type space uh, reasonably within the budget of the project. Um, uh, other amenities that you see here, we have the expanded concessions at the new entry here and uh, we have the restrooms are all highlighted in blue because we plan to, we've budgeted for replacement of finishes, maybe new tile, new fixtures, things of that nature, overhaul of the restrooms and then some additional restrooms will be added as part of the entry expansion so we can alleviate some of the lines and the issues with uh, people backing up at the concessions and we hope to be able as we further refine this uh, design concept, we hope to be able to actually maybe remove some of these existing concessions that block the view from the concourse into the arena so that we could have a more open feel to the, to the overall concourse space and give it a little bit of a modern look. Additionally, we're looking at opportunities to replace uh, the, um, the center cube with uh, new media, a new media cube and potentially ribbon boards around the perimeter. Those are going to have uh, a huge impact to customer experience and they're also going to provide great opportunities for revenue from sponsorship and uh, additional revenue opportunities that you don't have right now. Let's see. Uh, keep moving here. So, the in terms of the uh, the Domer covered arena existing barn complex, we're uh, looking at a plan that would. I, I apologize, so. Commissioner. Huh? I, if I could just take a brief five minute recess, mm -hmm. uh, I've got an issue that has come up. Oh, if of course. that's possible. Sure. Of sure. course. Uh, I'll make a motion that we go into recess for five, five minutes. minutes. Of course. Uh, I'll second. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to take any of your time, so <laughs> motion approved three to zero. <laughs> Jane, do we? Okay. So uh, I'll go ahead and continue with uh, some of the presentation of our uh, our concepts for the master plan. The considerations for uh, for the domer, the existing covered arena, and the existing livestock uh, building, a after we went through the iterations of looking at replacing all of these facil facilities, there was even a, a plan that looked at removing all these and completely building new. Uh, we uh, we decided that in, as part of this balanced approach, it was recommended to us that we wanted to try and to see how much of this uh, existing facility we could preserve and enhance. And part of our goal, uh, I think, is to do a renovation to this facility that will create a space that is, is relatively commensurate with the new spaces being created so that we wouldn't have a brand new building that half of the uh, equine competitors, for example, would be in, and then, a, and then an old, <laughs> Worn out building that that the other half would be have to have to be at right, so so a lot of the goal here is is to uh, try and, and bring the experience of this uh, these existing facilities up to a similar standard as what will be experienced in the new facility, and in addition to that we were trying to look for opportunities that we could make this space more flexible and and a little bit more. Uh, reorganize it in a way that it could be uh, work with the flow of the rest of the buildings a little bit better 
And um, <clears throat> so a few considerations, what we are exploring with this, as I mentioned in the master plan, is that Western Avenue would be along the um, top side of this drawing here. And um, I apologize, I can't, my laser pointer doesn't work on that <laughs> screen over there. <laughs> um, but, uh, and then we're creating the two, a load in, load out lane and a bypass lane along Western that would be partitioned from Western to keep that traffic internal to the site as best as possible. Um, and then other uh, major uh, work that we'd like to see done on this facility is to enclose the existing uh, open the warm-up arena right now is a three-sided structure basically so it's open air on one side we'd like to see that uh, arena space to be enclosed and then the removal of the wall between Domer Arena and the warm-up arena. So what we've created there is is a very long dirt floor arena that could be partitioned into warm-up and event space uh, in a flexible manner. So different shows could, could partition that and have the event area on one end or the other. And we've seen that done pretty successfully in some other venues uh, where, where it works well for a, for a small show if you want to rent just this complex for, for a show independent of the rest of the facility then you might have the warm up on the end closest to the barns uh, and the event arena here or this could end up being uh, a partitioned uh, warm up arena before you go into a larger event in Landon, for example, if you're, use, if you're utilizing Landon for, for your major event uh, arena. So what we wanted to do is just, given the space that we had, try and create the most amount of flexibility possible. And, and so those were two, two big moves that we've, uh, we've identified for this building. And in addition to that, to support those efforts, we would like to see the circulation expanded so you actually have uh, 360 circulation around the, uh, the dirt floor arena space. Uh, there really should be a little bit of circulation right here. Um, and then what we've done is, is uh, for those familiar with the equine facility, we have reoriented the stall layout to uh, better accommodate all the move in and move out that's coming primarily from the south end of these stalls uh, to move through the through the stall rows and and one way that we've accomplished that is by proposing the existing wash stalls in the barn area be removed and replaced as a lean-to structure along uh, the um, it would be the, the east wall of the facility. So the, this would provide modern wash stall facilities like you would see at Oklahoma State Fairgrounds, for example. It would allow us the opportunity to revamp those and create uh, a higher quality amenity for the user there. And um, it also gets those right out of the middle of the traffic way for the, for the rest of the uh, uh, competitors. An additional proposal is to add an, an additional load in load out ramp at the northeast corner because right now due to the, to the due to the grades of this facility the uh, the parking area where you're loading in and out of the majority of the trailers is about six feet higher or so than than the um, than the actual event floor. So these location and number of ramps limits the amount of accessibility for, for a large number of competitors to try and move a lot of uh, tack and, uh, and various other um, items, the refrigerators and sofas and all kinds of stuff um, in and out of these uh, stall barn areas here. So what we're attempting to do with this design is, is open up more points of access to improve the, the safety and the conflict of the circulation on Western and to create the most flexible, usable space possible with the dirt floor arenas. In addition to that, we've also proposed a renovation of the restrooms and the cafe. So those, that's primarily in uh, the nature of the finishes. So the, the quality of the finishes would be improved so that this would feel like a, a more modern facility. And we also have some, some other items in here, deferred maintenance items. We have some significant structural <laughs> issues that need to be reviewed and repaired along uh, Western where uh, water from the, uh, from the retaining wall has caused deterioration of some of the steel. Uh, our structural uh, consultants have reviewed that and, and 
have told us it's it's fixable and it's not uh, going to come at an expense where we're we would need to consider whether that building either stays or, or goes so the assessment of the structural integrity of, of those facilities was also a big catalyst in the decision to uh, to not try and replace them uh, and, and as always if we can when we're working with a limited budget if we can try and reuse and adapt things that we have currently that's that's going to be their preference because that that'll freeze up dollars that we can spend on other amenities um, the uh, so this is a, a quick layout for the uh, the multi-use uh, stalling and expo facility. So this is the facility that you saw adjacent to Land and Arena, and the proposal here is that it's uh, it's basically an open floor space with uh, with an electrical grids suitable to be able to drop in 10 by 10 uh, equestrian stalls. I think we've got about 240 250 in there. Um, and uh, and those stalls could also be removed, and we could use those same electrical drops to put in uh, an expo uh, type event. Mm -hmm. Now it's going to be a little lower quality space than the expo space that you have uh, adjacent to Landon right now. We would propose an asphalt floor in this space, which is commensurate with what we're seeing on a national level at most of the uh, large equine mm -hmm. event centers. And uh, it, it works really well, I think. Um, but it's durable, and it's it's better for the horses than concrete, and it allows the flexibility, the multi-use flexibility. So uh, one of the uh, other considerations we looked at is, is trying to ensure we had uh, a good number of restrooms that we've located, uh, restrooms on each end of the facility, so that it um, uh, provides that amenity for any of the users. Um, and then we've designed it with uh, with multiple overhead door access that aligns with the uh, excuse me that aligns with the um, anticipated uh, organization of the stalls or the expo booths, and also aligns with the covered connectors and even a potential maybe far future covered connector. We've we've left open the possibility of connecting this directly into land and arena at some point. Uh, with the way that it's sited and the way that the um, that the connections are made right now, currently in the budget, this is planned as a facility that would be heated and naturally ventilated uh, without cooling. We want to design the facility with the uh, with the idea in mind that it could, in the future, be an air conditioned facility if uh, if the budget was made available for that or the or the, the expo need grew to the point where something of that nature was um, was required and I would just like just point out as with any of these plans these are very conceptual in nature in order to help us with the with the early costing of the facilities as well as getting the footprints into the site plan and making sure everything works with with roads and things like that and as we move forward with the um, with the design of these venues I think we're going to be looking at any opportunity we can to enhance the quality of experience there if the budget appears that it's going to be amenable to, uh, to adding air conditioning for example or uh, for example in the uh, the covered arena facility here right now it's a simple covered arena but I would would like to see this designed with a structure that's capable of being enclosed in the future or even as an ad alternate if we have the budget to uh, to do so um, and so this is the final uh, new facility that's proposed and this is a uh, it's a simple building it's a covered arena that will serve to uh, provide additional warm-up or event space for equine livestock uh, events uh, these can be multi-purpose but in facilities of this nature they tend to mostly just be reserved for for equine livestock use so we would we would propose a, a dirt floor with the, with a quality uh, footing suitable for for multi-use equestrian events and then we've also proposed a lean-to structure on one side of it here so this structure uh, is a covered structure that's on the side nearest the barns and the parking area so you could pull in portable bleacher seating into this area you could pull uh, 
uh, for example, uh, food trucks, things of that nature along one side of it. So you can make this into a nice event space for, particularly for a smaller event uh, that that maybe didn't have the budget to to move into one of the bigger indoor facilities. And and as I mentioned there in the master plan, we'd envision a covered connector to be able to connect this across to Domer, uh, which would also uh, allow connection into the stall barn via that that one covered connector so that's uh i think question. the um we have a quick question yes Can yes go back to that? thank you mm -hmm. um so in the proposal it talks about enclosing the existing arena remodeling and then mm -hmm. closing that arena correct but then with this arena it's it's open this is open air on the sides but, okay. covered. but covered so i think we would in the design process of something like that, we'd probably look carefully at where we might need to strategically, pla strate strategically <laughs> place um, windscreens or or things of that nature around the around the outside of the venue, so that we could uh, make sure that that we try and create as much comfort as possible in that facility when it's being utilized for for events. So there's things that, of that nature that we can do um, that, that we do at other venues. And uh, I, think, I think in the long term, ideally, it would be great to get this to be an indoor and enclosed facility with, um, with heating and, and natural ventilation. Uh, and, and I think we're going to look carefully at, at attempting to do that as we move forward with the more uh, uh, detailed plans and, and uh, cost estimations, things of that nature. But right now, given the other items on the budget and the balanced approach, we felt that uh, this, was, this was actually one of the very last decisions made when we were looking at that budget um, that uh, Chuck's going to talk through that we had to we had to find another million dollars somewhere <laughs> and we you know as a design team and as the uh, advisory committee I think we all struggled with with where's that going to come from in order to hit the budget number that Betty had identified that she thought was a prudent number for us to uh, to try and make and that's when the the walls came off of this guy. It was, it was <laughs> literally the last decision. We held on to it as long as we could. And so I think those are, those are considerations moving into a more detailed design process that we uh, hopefully will hit a favorable bid market and the estimates will look a bit better. We've, we've tried to be conservative with our cost estimates. It's really prudent to be as conservative as possible at sure. this early phase. And so uh, that's something that, um, that we're going to look at for all of these is, is making sure we get the most return for the investment made. Great. Uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Chuck, who uh, is going to come and talk a little bit about the schedule. Yeah. Before we move forward. Um, if, if, uh, if there's some questions that you have about some of these amenities, these things that we kind of breeze through, uh, we have a tremendous amount of detail about, in particular, the items in Landon, about the seating replacement, things of that nature, in the, in the broader master plan. And, and we could pull some of that up and, and talk to it if, if uh, desired. Yeah. Thank you. And I think the, the master plan booklets that you have have that detail in it. So, um, so a little bit about budget and schedule. Um, as we look through, uh, I have this up there. So you know, it's anticipated that we'd move forward with Part B or the design and, and the construction of the project is in early 2018 um, and making every attempt we can to start into some construction projects in the summer of 2018. Um, we see it as a 30-month to three-year uh, uh, construction process, so we want to get started as quickly as we can to fight off any any escalation uh, that we might see in construction, which everybody knows is or probably heard it's starting to happen a uh, long time coming. Um, so this kind of generally outlines this will be massaged and tweaked and in greater, much greater details. We go through the design process and we learn what we can package as together what we can pull out and do earlier or then then later what needs to go with other things uh, you know we don't want to start replacing air conditioning somewhere on a building and then find out well we changed the design of that building and the loads are different and the layout's different now we got to take some of that back out and do it all over again so whatever that might be we want to make sure that uh, as we start to pull off parts and pieces that those those elements make sense to be pulled off and we don't have to back up and start all over again um, 
generally the larger components uh, as Charlie went through them the kind of the line items of what those what those budgeted elements there are uh, you can see soft costs and contingency is identified there and total construction a value of around 30 million dollars um, soft cost contingencies uh, around six million dollars financing around 8.6 million dollars as anticipated at this point in time I know that uh, the commissioners have uh, you know have that that hurdle to cover yet in terms of how we fund and finance this project uh, also a total of 45 million I think the thing to point out on this budget again are some of the unmet needs are below that line um, and some of those things like uh, like Charlie talked about in closing uh, an arena um, dirt, dirt buildings dirt storage buildings and and some of those air conditioning facilities all those begin to fall into the green and the gray our master plan and our soft cost includes designing for the elements that are in the green <laughs> unmet needs so if we have as we have favorable uh, conditions and bidding or if there's other funding mechanisms or reductions in the cost to finance the project we can go ahead and get those projects ramped up and into and, and, and out and bid and constructed the items that are in the gray unmet need are, are just right now simply we're not sure we could ever get to those get to those without some substantial change in either how it's financed and a substantial decrease in financing costs or other monies that are brought in uh, to the project so they're out there um, and they're listed those range from continuing the uh, ex expansion on the east side of land and arena to, to a new southeast enclosure that extends its way all the way over and connects to the new stall barn and as well as bringing that st uh, stall barn up to an expo level type of facility so lots of great ideas that were down there but didn't shake out in in the 45 million dollars any questions there So, you know, quickly, that's really kind of the end of our presentation of that. You know, where we go from here? Well, obviously, we need to adopt and approve a master plan and then obviously address the funding mechanisms and then get on with the, the process of designing and engineering and constructing the facility. So. Well, I've got a few slides here of what what the facility just again at a concept plan of what it might look like um, or how we might change how the facility uh, looks I, I think I don't want to underplay or at least Bill and I were talking about the notion of, of refreshing both the domer facilities as well as land and expo facilities the idea that the facilities need to be brought up into a modern standards they need to have certain amenities to compete with other venues out there that are newer and fresher and so many of these things will are do, being done actually quite affordably uh, we believe but I'll have a bigger impact and a, and a more attractability to other events and promoters and and those kinds of things as well as I think um, our patrons of, of Shawnee County realizing that we did some good here so so there's a number of slides here the um, on this kind of overview here to Charlie's point well in the top left would be the the arena additional equine arena the stone the new stolen barn the expansion to the front of Expo for better circulation accessibility expanded concourse for uh, better um, better customer service better customer amenity uh, customer amenities and those kind of things and then Dover um, enclosed and renovated on the back side um, and then some ideas about how that the front of the circulation both pedestrian and vehicular circulation might be modified to improve that as you come in from the east off of Topeka Boulevard <coughs> But that be happy to answer any questions we can commissioners go ahead go first well um, commissioner Wheeler, you've put, i think put in a lot of work uh, sitting on the committee um, as well as the committee thank you for everything you've done and bringing this to us this is a considerable amount of work i think early on at the very beginning you said there were over 400 volunteer hours that have been applied towards getting us to this point um, and this significantly improves the Expo Center from where we are at today. <coughs> Looking always at those unmet needs, uh, the things that are left undone, uh, some of them uh, trying to see where would you be able to fit those into the plan. Mm -hmm. 
but I think this does identify the needs and really uh, capitalizing on the strengths as CSL brought out of the Expo Center. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, I think uh, Charlie may have said it. <clears throat> Multi-use is, is pretty key. I think we've talked about that from the very beginning and um, the modeling that CSNL did really helps support that balanced approach and I think that's what taxpayers should be most concerned about mm -hmm. is that uh, we're we're not only um, helping economic impact but then financial operations as well and and that helps our county budget as well so um, I you know I'm anxious for the next steps I know I know that this was the first introduction to the public on the plans and I I hope we we get some feedback um, and then at some point in time, I, I don't know when this is back on the agenda for the commission to adopt the master plan. Um, I look forward to that. But I also look forward to the discussions about funding um, and how we're going to finance this and any discussion on deferred maintenance and whether those costs can be covered. Um, another way to help meet those unmet needs. I might just note. If anybody in the audience has between 12 and 20 million dollars just sitting <laughs> sure. around. I, I too want to thank the, the committee. Um, yeah. The design team did a huge amount of work. Um, there were some long meetings, some really tough decisions. Um, but a, a, good, a good product, I think, so far. Thank so. you. Okay. Very good. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank the team also uh, for the many volunteer hours. Uh, I want to hear from the public uh, today, and uh, I don't think we're going to make a decision today. We need, this is a lot of information. Uh, I'm looking at it, wow, it, it's a lot of information to process. So I'm thinking uh, a, a decision perhaps a week from now, uh, just so for planning purposes. I, but I, I've got to say, in looking at that, does the new the new stalling barn looks like it takes away from the appearance of the Expo Center, to be honest with you. I uh, just visually looking at it, uh, I'm not a fan. Yeah. So one thing to remember is, is a master plan. And one thing part of our images is it was not the over promise uh, in some of our design work. But that's duly noted, also noted by the advisory committee that anything that we oh. could do in to the front of the a uh, stalling barn to make it look like it's just an extension of right. the of land and arena would be very very much preferred so we've got that on our list when we get into design to tackle that tackle that uh, okay. imagery of what that building might look like okay and i wasn't even on the committee <laughs> <laughs> think that, just like so we were. anyway uh, thank you I, anything else for chuck Let's, if anyone wants to make uh, comments about the master plan so we can, we can begin the process of, of listening to the public, step right up. And Commissioner, I don't yes. know, on time frame, I don't know on the 18th um, if that is the best time to decide. I mean, I know it's, everybody's busy with the holidays and everything. I know, I know this is something we don't want to delay, but right. yet... I want to make sure that we're giving the public every opportunity to. Do you have create. another day I, in I, mind? I or? don't. Um, I just just keep that in mind okay. as we hear feedback. Okay. Good. Good. Step right up. I know I'm not a member of the public, but I did want to get <laughs> up and, uh, <laughs> and and share you know our support throughout this process. I know Spectra <laughs> as a as a company, uh, we came on pretty late in the game. Uh, and we've done our, our best due diligence to work with the team uh, in, in helping develop a plan that I think works for uh, a lot of the reason that you, you brought us here in the first place. Uh, you know, part of uh, Spectra's commitment to this venue uh, was to increase the, the sales and marketing platform uh, as a whole. And I think some of the, the elements in the plan and the design uh, that's put forth within this master plan uh, really help us achieve that goal. Uh, it gives us an, an opportunity to really focus on the customer, uh, focus on uh, the community and, and give them a facility that they can be proud of uh, and give them a reason that they can stay here as opposed to uh, taking those dollars and those entertainment dollars out of the market. We really want to increase from, from our effort 
uh, not only the marketing and sales platform, but bring in uh, the, the quality products and services and, and type of entertainment value uh, that, the, that the community can really start to rally behind. Uh, so we wanted to, uh, I, I wanted to get up and, and share our support of the, the master plan and, and happy to answer uh, as we move forward down the line any kind of operational questions that, that may arise from uh, design elements within the master plan and, and some of those uh, features as well. Uh, we shared your, your same concern with uh, the aesthetics, so we, we would like to see those. Um, and, and again, it's all conceptual at this point, so, um, but happy to answer any questions as we get going along. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Anyone else? Come right up. Well, I could, I could just stand right there. No, we, we need you to talk into the microphone for the record. All right. Well, uh, my name is Marty Bloomquist, and I'm a Shawnee County resident. And uh, you're, you are, all three of you are absolutely right. This is a lot of information to uh, ruminate on. And so uh, I think we need some time to, to look at it and think about it. And uh, do you have a protocol right now for receiving comments on this plan? Yes, we do. We accept emails and phone calls. Uh, commission at SNCO dot uh, US. So, <laughs> so that's where we send all of our comments, yes. right? Yes. Yes. Commission. Okay. And our phone numbers are published uh, almost daily in the Capital yeah. Journal on the editorial page. Uh, but do we? <laughs> Is there one central phone number, though, that people can send to? Jane, what's our central phone number? I don't call it very So 251-4040? yes. 4040, okay. Yes. That was it. All right. Thank, Thank you, you for being here. Looks Thank you. Good for so far. Very good first blush. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else for uh, public comment this morning regarding the master plan for the Expo Center? Uh, I'm Darren Foltz. I'm the president of the Kansas Buckskin Horse Association and the vice president of the ABRA. We hold um, four shows a year at the Kansas Expo Center, have for several years. Um, this is the first that we've seen of this, so like Marty said, it's a lot to take in. Right off the bat, there's a few concerns that, you know, that just, that just pop into my head. But I had a couple questions. Is this going to be publicized? Is the plan, the, the diagram, going to be put on a website that we can it, send some of our people to is, look uh, at? It already is on the website. If you look under uh, the agenda for today, under, uh, I think it's commission agenda, and then look for the agenda with the attachments. Mm -hmm. I think all of this is, is on, uh, there's, I think the total agenda with attachments is like 290 pages. And then it includes all the information. Okay, everything uh, that we've seen here today. And more. Okay, good, more. good. Yeah, a lot more. Um, um, that would be great. On the on the planning board it, or on the planning commission, is there equine enthusiasts on there to answer some of the detailed questions that may arise in the planning portion of it? I know that you said that you had um, contacted lots of um, equine people to um, come with this plan or come with some of the ideas. I was just curious as to who some of those people were and if they were people that make their living doing this um, or um, what types of people that were that, that you did contact okay. for it. I was just curious. Um, and we can provide a list of, of the people that participated. Um, off the top of my head, um, if if it's a covered pen down there, I don't know how much the cost of just that building alone is, but it would probably be for nothing if if it isn't enclosed. It would be, I've, I show horses all over the country, have for years, I've made horses my living for my entire life. If the barns are not connected and that's not enclosed, it's basically going to be for nothing. I mean, that's just right off the top of my head. Um, it'll be interesting to see how everybody plays in. Like I say, this is all just brand new to us, um, but I'll, you know, I'll 
touch out, reach out there and have people look at it and, and give some feedback to you guys on via email or phone call. Absolutely. We, we appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I think we might have a discussion with IT and maybe see if they could make that um, a little more prominent on our website, the, the yeah. packet with just the... Yeah, is the, the, uh, uh, right up front when yeah. you, you sign on maybe a good thing to do. Okay. That'd yeah. be great. And, and just the master plan. Yeah. That would, I think that'd be great. Yeah. So if you go on uh, the the uh, Shawnee County website, then that'll be the first thing that comes yeah. up. That's a great yeah. idea. Thank you, Commissioner. Anyone else uh, for discussion? I just have a couple of questions. And basically, all you folks are still here. Um, not to even change plans or anything else, but one thing on your parking on the west side. Is this going to then be a one-way in and out? I was just trying to figure in my mind how traffic would run to get trailers and trucks and all in and back around the parking. One way. And one way. if we could, just for our clerk, I know she's going to want your name. Oh, oh I'm sorry, Chuck Sperry. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, Chuck. I'm sorry. I I own CJ Quarter Horses out here at the south side of town. Been in this industry for a little while. Okay. Um, but no, I was just looking at that as to how that would run so that you can keep horse people just kind of go every direction so it's uh, <laughs> kind of the way it is um, another thing I thought about was the multi-purpose building which I think is a great idea as a person that puts on shows if I've got let's say for easy thinking a facility that holds 250 stalls here and 250 stalls there once let's say I have I need 275 stalls so the other 25 stalls, am I going to have to rent that whole building to be able to get those 25 stalls for competitors coming in? They're not cost prohibitive, uh, or it is cost prohibitive to ever do something like that. That's where I always like to kind of see as many of my stalls put together as what we can, so you just expand out from that. Um, that's the only thing, but I, I think the idea of being able to use the facility for something is great. But that's just a, and that's something you guys would have to decide, you know, of yes, what your what your cost going to be. Because if I can't, let's say I'm going to put on a 275, 200, 300 uh, stall show, I probably can't afford to pay for a stall building that's going to have 250 more. Do you follow what I'm saying? Right. Um, you know, in other words, I could, I could afford this and do this part, but when I had to add this on, depends on what that's going to cost me to do so. You know, unless I can get four or five hundred stalls uh, spoke for, and that's going to be tough because I can tell you, if you get five hundred stalls with all the trailers and trucks and everything coming in, I don't think you got enough parking. I really don't. You might, but it's be pretty jammed. Okay. I'm just going off of what Tulsa and Oklahoma City have that we show at a lot, but but that's basically all I have. Just a couple of questions, so looking at things. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. I tried to keep my mouth shut, but I can't do it. My name is Ann White, and you've all heard from me before. And I just like to kind of ditto what you've heard as a person that makes their living horse showing all over the country, and as a person that hosts many um, horse shows here at the Expo Center. The the covered arena at the South End makes kind of little sense. I know it would be of no use for me for my horse shows if you don't have the the flow and, and consistency where they can warm up. A, number one, two, with no sides, it's so limiting on what months it could be used. But you have to have, in order to use that as a competitive field, there has to be access right there to a warm up. And I see if you move, if you took out and moved the, the arena in Domer now and butted it up against the stall, you could possibly put warm up at the south end that could facilitate warm up <coughs> in the new building. But there has to be some place for the tractors then and the I mean you know and the sides <coughs> kind of make it a useless building to me so thank you thank you Ann I'm Leroy Russell with Shawnee County Extension and uh, K-State Research and Extension appreciate all the work that you've done to uh, improve our ag facilities uh, there at the Expo Center. Some concerns and questions, I guess, is first of all, uh, it is a, our venue where we have our Shawnee County Fair. And uh, it's, I don't know if we can still unload and, and, and like 
swine, sheep, goats uh, on the south end of uh, Domer or uh, where we could go because uh, we don't want to intermix the, the unloading cattle and unloading sheep and goats or we'd have a real rodeo there. So uh, <laughs> that's important. And uh, two, uh, one of our good partners is a weed department, so we hope that that facility stays there because often I send people down to that location uh, with questions and, and to get get their sprayers or, or those kind of things. And it would be wonderful to have a different unloading area than a lot of times we can't get in and out of our parking lot uh, there north of the barn because horse trailers are unloading. So I think that's a, a very positive thing. Thank you. Thank you, Leroy. Anyone else want to comment on the master plan for the Expo Center? Um, I would, uh, oh, come right up. I am <clears throat> Justin Jansen. I think I represent the Kansas Horse Council. We host uh, an equine event there in February, the Equifest. This will be the third year coming up in 2018. We're currently outgrowing your facility. Uh, we were baited to come to Topeka with the thoughts that this expansion would happen relatively quickly and we're already uh, reaching limitations both on vendors and the number of horses that we can bring into the current facility so we really embrace this expansion uh, personally I, I think we're very impressed with some of the ideas that have been presented uh, this morning but we're also probably early frustrated with uh, the lack of that second arena being an enclosed facility and I think there was reference to it having an awning put on it so that it could be bleachers. Um, our event would, would necessitate that we have bleacher space in that event. And I, I would really encourage the commission to seek input from some of the horse people that have already spoken about their concerns. Uh, you have people that operate on a national level that I think could facilitate the plans that are already in place uh, to facilitate the flow. So thank you for this opportunity. Okay. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? <coughs> I did want to uh, mention that we have, have members from the uh, Expo uh, Advisory Board. Brenda Block is here. Sandra Griffith is here. I see Mary Thomas is here. I want to recognize Brett Otting from Visit Topeka. Uh, I think I've got all of the uh, advisor did i miss no, somebody I think it, if you guys could stand because it's kind of hard to bill pick beach. bill beach yeah bill oh. you still here bill and bill beach oh, yeah and bill beach. did see you back there okay <laughs> so. uh again thank you for your service and thank you to the to the team uh, i i'm still looking at uh, maybe a week from today if you have a different idea let's well, let's I'm talk about it ask betty a question as far as just on discussion of uh, what you're seeking then is a approval of this master plan correct yes. but then we still have not had discussion about financing or deferred maintenance or anything like that so I guess I'm I'm looking for some guidance on timing of all this uh, I don't want to approve a master plan and then we still we're, we're gonna still have changes to it okay what we have done on the financing is I have come up with a conservative estimate of the financing costs okay. um, I am hoping that sometime in the first part of the year we can look at actually uh, moving ahead with that financing and then come up with some some definite dollars on that um, you know as as the economy changes and as legislation changes that can have a big impact on interest rates right. and the trend on interest rates is <coughs> they are increasing so I don't want to wait uh, very long on that even a, a quarter of a percent can make a significant amount mm. when you're paying it over 14 years so um, I am, am hopeful that we can look at something like that in the first part of 18 we have used very conservative numbers to come up with uh, the amount that we think we can spend on the actual project because you know the, the 45 million includes all of the financing costs then if our financing cost comes in lower than that if we have additional um, sources of funds that we can use then those some of those items that are unmet right now can be moved up 
um, and included in the project. So, but timing wise, I, I think it's also very important we need to move pretty quickly or as quickly as we feel comfortable doing um, on the financing early in 2018. Yeah. <coughs> I, I just don't think a week is enough time. So, I, you know, the 21st or the 28th, the, even the 28th after Christmas, he'll be gone that day. Oh, darn. Um, just. Okay. The 21st is next Thursday. Okay. Commissioner Cook, you better. Yeah. Okay with you. Yeah. Just, just a few more days, I think, oh, just to okay. get enough sure. time. Sure. Well, we will plan on uh, finalizing and discussing discussing further uh, the master plan on December 21st for planning purposes so everyone will know. Commissioner Archer. Yes, Commissioner Cook. I just, uh, in speaking with uh, Jane Rizek, our administrative assistant, it's my understanding that on Thursday there's going to be a presentation from the Equifest um, individuals regarding Equifest. Mm -hmm. So um, I anticipate that we'll probably hear quite a bit then. Sure, that's good. Um, and then as well as on the 21st. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Any other? Next item, please. Item 5, administrative communications. This is uh, an opportunity to discuss something other than the Expo Center. <laughs> our capital Master outlay. Plan, uh, can, we're, we're not adjourned yet, please. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, this is Dusty Nichols, Emergency Management. And I just wanted to pass on. We are in extreme fire danger in the county uh, today and uh, potentially the rest of the week. Uh, if you plan on burning, please contact your local fire department um, and find out if there's any burn bans. If you are having to burn or you do have to burn with a fire pit, a barbecue, a cigarette, anything that causes sparks, please be extra careful um, of what you're doing with that. And uh, just help us not burn the county down. That would be great. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, that would be good. Thank you, Dusty. Anyone else for administrative communication? Commissioner Bueller. I want to say in particular, Dusty, did he leave? Congratulations to Dusty Nichols and Eve Kendall. They've been chosen for uh, participants in Leadership Greater Topeka, Class of 2018. So congratulations to both of you. That's all I have. Okay. Commissioner Cook. Nothing today. Um, yeah, congratulations to Eve and Dusty. That, that's great. I did want to mention that, that uh, the commissioners uh, worked at the Red Stocking Breakfast uh, on Saturday morning. It was a great event. Uh, it was, I think it was busiest, I, I can recall, after years and years. Um, I know Commissioner Cook was, was serving uh, coffee and juice, and uh, I served, uh, and Commissioner Bueller also. I was the the chief uh, casserole and hash brown supervisor <laughs> that morning and, and thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, what a great opportunity to meet people from the from the community. So next item, please. I have six executive staff. There's not a need, so we're officially adjourned. Thank you for coming today.